Chapter 11 Christopher must have used some magic then. He and the dog both stopped as if they had run into a wall. I overran a little and stopped myself on a doorknob on the other side of the corridor. The Count turned himself so that his frosty look could hit me as well as Christopher. I had no idea what to do, but Champ had no doubt. His tail thumped. He crawled forward, quivering with shame, to the full stretch of Christopher's neckcloth, and tried to get into licking distance of the Count's beautiful, shiny shoes. Christopher just stood and looked at the Count as if he was summing him up. This was where being an amateur was a big help. Christopher would not have minded being sacked on the spot. He had more or less found Millie now, and he could make himself invisible and come back to finish the job. But I still had my evil fate to think of. I stared at the Count, too, hoping and hoping to know he was the one causing my fate. But all I could see was a young fellow in expensive evening dress, who had every right to stare at us in outrage. "'Come on,' Count Robert said. "'Explain. Why are you dragging poor old Champ around up here?' "'It's more that he was dragging us,' Christopher said. "'From the look of him, I think he caught your scent, my lord.' "'Yes, he did, didn't he?' Count Robert agreed, looking thoughtfully down at Champ, who wagged and groveled more than ever. But that doesn't explain why he's here, or why all of you are covered with black gunk. At this, Christopher drew breath, presumably to begin on the drain's story. No, said the Count, not you. I can see you'd just tell me something glib and untrue. Christopher looked hurt and indignant, and the Count turned to me. You tell me. It seemed to me that I'd nothing more to lose. I knew I was about to be sacked and sent home in disgrace. Wondering what Uncle Alfred would say, and then thinking dismally that I would be dead by next year anyway, so what did Uncle Alfred matter either, I said, We went past the painted line in the attics. Champ was at the bottom of a wooden tower there, but we couldn't have got him back up it, so we waited until it changed into an empty slate building. Christopher muttered, Believe it or not, I was going to tell you that too. The Count gave him a disbelieving sideways look. Honestly, Christopher said, I thought you'd probably guessed. More or less, said Count Robert. His frosty look tipped up at the edges and became a slight grin. You were unlucky to get those two towers straight off. Hugo and I didn't run into them for years. Well now, what shall we do about it? I don't think any of you should be seen as you are. Amos is prowling around the next floor in a rage. About us? I said anxiously. No, no, about something I told him, the Count said. But he'd certainly better not see you or Champ as you are. He'd fire you both on the spot if he knew where you'd been. So he considered for a second. Give me the dog. Hugo and I can get him cleaned up in my rooms. Luckily, Champ is well known to be a friend of mine, and then I can take him down to the stables. You two go and get fresh clothes, or you'll be in real trouble. We both said, with real gratitude, Thank you, my lord. Count Robert smiled. There was a sad sort of look to him, smiling. No problem. Here, Champ. Christopher let go of the neckcloth. It was an X neckcloth, really, more of a dirty string by this time. Champ immediately sprang to his hind legs and attempted to put both his paws on the shoulders of the Count's evening jacket. The Count caught the paws just in time, in a way that showed he had had a lot of practice, and said, No, down, Champ. I love you too, but there's a time and a place for everything. He put Champ down on all four feet, and took firm hold of the X neckcloth. Off you go, he said to us. We scurried away to the attic stairs. I looked around as we went, and saw Count Robert using one of his gleaming shoes to urge Champ into the family lift. 
Get on, stupid, he was saying. It's quite safe. Or do you want to meet Amos in a rage? Christopher was very excited as we sped back to the clothes store. My guess was right, Grant. You heard the count, did you? There are lots more places beside those two frightful towers. Millie must be in one. Will you come with me to look for her tomorrow on our morning off? Well, of course I would. I could hardly wait to explore. Next time, I thought, I would take my camera with me too and collect some real evidence of other worlds or dimensions or whatever they were. Before that, of course, we had to get into new clothes, hide the gunky ones in an empty room and rush off to our supper. Then we had to stand by the dining room wall with those stupid cloths over our arms while Mr. Amos, Andrew and two other footmen served the family with their dinner. Neither of us dared do a thing wrong. Mr. Amos was still in a rage. Whatever Count Robert had said to him, fury about it was bottled into Mr. Amos, so that he was like a huge pear-shaped balloon full of seething gas. Andrew and the other two tiptoed around him. Christopher and I tried our best to look like part of the wall. The Countess was in a rage too, but she wasn't doing nearly such a good job of bottling it as Mr. Amos was. I suppose she had no need to bother. Nothing was right for her that evening. There was a thumbprint on her wine glass, she said, a speck of dirt on her fork, she said, and iron mould on her napkin. Then she found a smear of pink polish on the salt cellar. Each time one of us was sent whizzing away to fetch a new one of whatever was wrong, and then, while she waited for it, she turned to Count Robert, opened her eyes wide, and did her why at him. When I came back with a shiny new salt cellar, she was saying, Really, darling, you must grow out of this habit of only pleasing yourself. Count Robert stood up to it better than I would have done. He smiled and said, but you asked me to arrange it, mother. But not now, Robert. Not when we've got company coming to celebrate your engagement, the countess said. Amos, this plate is dirty. See this speck on the edge here? Mr. Amos leaned over her shoulder and inspected the plate. I believe that is part of the pattern, my lady. He shot Count Robert a mean look while he said it. I'll have it replaced at once, he said, and snapped his fingers at Christopher. By the time Christopher whizzed back with a fresh plate, Count Robert was really getting it in the neck. And you haven't even considered where this hireling of yours will eat, the Countess said. When I think of all the trouble I went to, to teach you that a gentleman should consider others, I quite despair of you, Robert. You behave like a greedy child. Greedy and selfish. Me, me, me. Your character is so weak. Why can't you learn to be strong just for once? Why? Christopher rolled his eyes at me as he took up his place by the wall again. And it really was amazing the way the Countess went on at Count Robert, who after all owned Story, as if he were about six years old, just as if there were no footmen standing like wooden statues, or us listening to her, or Mr. Amos by the serving table looking meanly glad that the Count was in trouble. I was quite embarrassed, but I was also pretty curious to know what Count Robert had done to annoy the Countess and Mr. Amos so. By this time, the Countess was on about the way the weakness of Count Robert's character had shown up when he was a toddler and kept reminding him of bad things he had done when he was two and four and ten years old. The Count just sat there, bearing it. Lady Felice kept her head down over her plate, but the Countess noticed her, too. I'm glad to see that your silly little eating disorder is over, dear. It was nothing, Mother, Lady Felice said. So then the Countess decided that the fish was overcooked, and told Mr. Amos to send it back to the kitchen. Mr. Amos snapped his fingers at me to take it. And be sure, he said, handing me the loaded tray, to tell Chef exactly what her ladyship found wrong with it. 
I missed the next bit while I went away through the hall and the swing door, down the steps to the undercroft and on to the kitchen. But Christopher said it was just more of the same. In the kitchen, the chef put his hands on his hips and stared at me humorously. All the footmen called him the great dictator, but I thought he was quite a nice man. And what's supposed to be wrong with it? he asked me. She says it's overcooked, I said. She's in a really bad mood. One of those evenings, eh? the chef said. Slimming spells disagreed with her, and she's saving herself for the roast, is she? All right, get back and tell her that yours truly grovels all over the carpet, and you needn't mention that this fish was perfect. Back I went, all the way to the dining room, where I managed to go in almost exactly as I was supposed to, slipping in sideways with nearly no noise. Mr. Amos was waiting there for me. Behind his bulky pear shape, the room felt like a thunderstorm. And what has Chef to say for himself? he demanded, low and urgent. He grovels on the carpet, and I'm not to say the fish was perfect, I said. That was stupid of me. I think it was Christopher's influence that made me say it. Mr. Amos had the perfect opportunity to get rid of some of his bad temper on me. He gave me a glare from his stone-coloured eyes that made my knees go weak. Luckily for me, Lady Felice chose that moment to jump up from her chair and fling her big white napkin onto the table. Two wine glasses went over. Mother, she said almost in a scream, will you stop going on at Robert as if he'd committed a crime? All he's done is hire the librarian you asked him to hire. So leave him alone, will you? The Countess turned to Lady Felice. Her eyes went wide, and her lips began shaping the wh of one of her dreadful whys. And if you say why, dear, once more, Lady Felice screamed, I shall pick up this candlestick and brain you with it. She gave out a sound like a laugh and a sob mixed, and rushed for the door. Mr. Amos and I both had to dodge. Lady Felice stormed past us and crashed out of the room like a warm, scented hurricane, and slammed the door behind her. In the rest of the room she left a feverish, dead silence. Andrew and the other footmen sprang into action, silently and on tiptoe, mopping up spilled wine, taking away the fallen glasses, and whipping away all the knives, forks and spoons still there at Lady Felice's place. The other two at the table simply sat there, while, just as if nothing had happened, Mr. Amos walked around to speak gently in the Countess's ear. Chef sends his profound apologies, my lady, and says it will not occur again. Allow me to bring on the next course, my lady. The Countess, in a frozen way, nodded. Because the footmen were still busy wiping up wine, Mr. Amos beckoned Christopher and me over to the food lift and passed us tureens and sauce boats to carry over to the table. I was not sure where to put things, but Christopher whirled everything across and dumped them any old where, and then bowed and patted the mats with both hands as if he knew just what he was doing. Mr. Amos glowered at him over his shoulder and picked up a massive platter piled with meat. The Countess, still looking frozen, said to Count Robert, Felice is so tiresome these days. I think it's high time she was married. I shall invite that nice Mr. Sully to dinner with our other guests. I feel sure I can induce Felice to marry him. Count Robert said, Are you making some kind of a joke, Mother? Not at all. I never joke, dear, said the Countess. Mr. Sully is mayor of Stalchester, after all. He is wealthy and widowed, and he has a very respectable position in life. And it's not important who Felice marries the way it is for you, dear. You are engaged to a title, but... Give me patience! Count Robert suddenly shouted out. 
He leaped to his feet, whacked his napkin on the table, and, like Lady Felice, made for the door with great strides. Just as Mr. Amos arrived with the platter of meat, I never could work out how Mr. Amos missed Count Robert. The Count did not seem to see either Mr. Amos or the meat. He just charged out through the door and banged it shut behind him. Mr. Amos somehow managed to raise the vast platter above both their heads and then to twirl himself away. The Countess sat still frozen, watching Mr. Amos waltzing around with the great steaming dish. When at last he stopped twirling, she said, "I don't understand, Amos. What is making my children so very tiresome lately?" I believe it is their extreme youth, my lady," Mr. Amos replied, laying the platter reverently down on the table. "They are mere adolescents, after all." Christopher's eyes swivelled to mine in amazement. As he said to me afterward, "You called people adolescents at his age and mine." Lady Felice has come of age," he said. "Even if they did have to cancel the party for it." And Count Robert must be in his twenties. Grant, do you think that the Countess is mad, and Mr. Amos humours her? He said that much later, though. At that time, we had to stand there while the Countess obstinately ploughed through three more courses, half a bottle of wine, and dessert, and looked angrier with every mouthful. Mr. Amos's bottled rage grew so huge that even Christopher hardly dared move. The footmen all pretended they were invisible, and so did I. And it did not stop there. The Countess laid down her napkin and went to the grand saloon, telling Mr. Amos that the improvers could bring her coffee there. This meant that Christopher and I had to race upstairs after with trays of comfits and chocolates, while Mr. Amos followed us with coffee, herding us like a rather heavy sheepdog. The grand saloon was vast. It stretched from the front to the back of the house and was full of things to fall over, like golden footstools and small shiny tables. The countess sat in the middle of it, where Christopher and I had to keep dribbling coffee for her into a cup so small that it reminded me of the crucibles Uncle Alfred did his experiments in. I drizzled in coffee, and Christopher dripped in cream. While Mr. Amos stood by the distant door, rocking on his small, shiny feet, and waiting for us to make a mistake so that he could vent some of his rage on us, we knew that the very least that could happen was that Mr. Amos would cancel our morning off. So we were very, very careful. We tiptoed and pawed for what seemed like a century, until the Countess said, "Amos, I wish to be alone now." By that time, my arms were shaking and my calves ached with tiptoeing, but we hadn't made any mistakes, so Mr. Amos had to let us go. Phew! I said when we were safely out of hearing. What has Count Robert done to make them both so angry? Did you find out? Well, Christopher said, scratching at his head so that his sleek hair separated into curls. You probably know as much as I do, Grant. But while you were away with the fish, the Countess did say something about hiring penniless students to catalogue the library here. Though why that should make anyone angry, I haven't a clue. After all, she's supposed to have asked Count Robert to hire someone. The librarian at Crestomancy Castle says you have to have a proper list of the books you've got, or you can't find any of them. And I can't see why that should make Mr. Amos angry as well. I felt suddenly full of an idea. Could it be? I said, that they have secret books in there, you know, books about pulling the possibilities or explaining how to work the changes at the top of the house. Christopher stood still in the passage outside our room. Now that is a notion, he said. Grant, I think we ought to take a look at this library when we're free tomorrow morning. Chapter Twelve. Naturally, that next morning we went to look at the top of the mansion first. 
Christopher was seriously anxious about this girl, Millie, and I was really excited about what we'd see there next. We went to the attics as soon as we were free. On the way, I dodged into our room and got my camera. I wanted to have proof that we weren't imagining the strange towers. As it was a dull sort of day, with fog down in Stallchester Valley, and only stall crags sticking up out of it, I made sure the flash was working. Christopher jumped at the sudden brightness. Don't count your chickens, Grant, he said, while we crept along to the streak of paint on the wall. You may not have anything to photograph. This made me sure that my bad karma would cancel out any chance of the mansion changing. But we were in luck. Just as we passed the stripe of paint, there was the most almighty sideways wrench. Christopher and I were thrown against each other and sort of staggered around in a half circle, with me hanging onto Christopher's neckcloth for balance. And as soon as we were facing the other way, we realized that the passage we had just come through was now a tall pointed archway made of stone. Beyond it was somewhere so shadowy and stony that I was glad I'd remembered my camera flash. Looks like that tower we hauled the dog up again, Christopher said as we went through the archway. It was nothing like the slate tower. The archway opened into a stone floored gallery held up on one side by fancy stone pillars, each pillar a different shape. The roof was a basketwork of stone vaulting, and the other wall was blank stone. The vaulting and the carvings on the pillars must have been picked out in gold paint once, but a lot of the gold had flaked off, leaving the patterns hard to see. From the space beyond the pillars there came vast, soft, shuffling echoes. It felt huge out there, but not as if people were living in it. It was more like the time my school had gone round Stalchester Cathedral, when the guide had taken us up into the passages in the dome. Christopher said, Millie's here, quite near, and set off at a run to the other end of the gallery, where the gloomy light came from. I raced after him, with my camera bouncing on my chest. The gallery opened into a big, curving stone staircase, leading down into the grey light. Christopher went plunging down the stairs, and I followed. And as soon as we came around the first curve, we realized we were on an enormous spiral, a double spiral, we realized, after the next curve. There was another staircase opposite ours, sort of wrapped around the one we were on. When we leaned over the high stone side, we could see the two staircases spiraling down and down. When we looked up, we saw the inside of a tower overhead. It had fancy windows in it, but they were so dirty that it was no wonder the place was in such gloom. Footsteps rang, like an echo of ours. We looked over at the other staircase, and there was a girl there, hurrying down to get to the same level as us. Christopher! she shouted. What are you doing here? It was hard to see what the girl was like because of the gloom and because the staircases were so big and so wide apart. But her voice sounded nice. She seemed to have a rounded face and straight brownish hair, but that was all I could see. I swung up my camera and photographed her as she dashed down opposite us, which made her stop and try to cover her eyes. Meet us at the bottom! Christopher shouted at her. His voice boomed around in a hundred echoes. I'll tell you then. In fact, he tried to tell her as we dashed on down and around, the two of us circling around Millie and Millie circling around us, while the space rang with our hurrying feet and the voices of the other two. They kept shouting at each other as they went, trying to explain what they were doing here, but I don't think either of them could hear properly because of the echoes. I could tell they were truly glad to see each other, I took several more photos as we went. It was such an amazing place. I think Millie shouted something like, I'm so pleased you came. I've been having such a frustrating time. This house keeps changing and I can't seem to get out. 
Me too, Christopher bellowed back. I have to take a job as a lackey. What do you get to eat? There's always food downstairs, Millie yelled in reply. But I don't know where it comes from. How did you get in? Christopher roared. The echoes got worse and worse. Neither of us could hear what Millie shouted in answer to this. Christopher roared again. You know the main changes happen at the top of the house, do you? I think Millie yelled back that of course she did. She wasn't a fool, but she never seemed to get anywhere. And she seemed to try and describe her frustrations as we all hammered down several more spirals. Then Christopher began bellowing across her description that one of the places was bound to be the perfect place for the two of them to live in secret. But we shot down the last curve at this point, and there was ceiling over the staircase. The echoes quite suddenly cut off, and we found ourselves in a plain stone hallway. Christopher stopped shouting and turned to me, "Quick, Grant, where's the other stairway?" We both ran along the hall to the place we thought the other spiral ought to come out, but there was only wall there. It had little windows in it that looked out onto woodland, so it was obviously wrong. We got turned around. Christopher panted, and he dashed back the other way so fast that I could barely keep up. There was a door at the end of the hall that way. Christopher thundered through it and on into the middle of a largish room, where he stopped dead beside a pile of sofas and armchairs with a sheet draped on top of them. Beyond that, big windows showed a garden that was mostly weeds. Rain was falling on the weeds. There were more windows showing more weeds in the left-hand wall, a harp or something in one corner, and nothing but a big empty fireplace in the right-hand wall. Not here, Christopher said in a defeated way. I only had time to take one photo of the harp thing before he was off again, back the way we had come to the hall and the staircase again. I think I saw a door, his voice said in the distance. Ah, yes. The door was behind the stairs. Christopher had opened it and rushed through before I caught up, but when I did, he was moving slowly and cautiously down the dark stone passage beyond. There was a door on each side and a door at the end. The door on the right was open, and we could see it was a sort of big cloakroom with a row of dusty boots on the floor. Several grimy coats on pegs, and a cobwebby window that looked out onto wet woodland. Christopher made angry noises and barged me aside to open the door across the passage. The room there was a dining room, as neglected and dusty as the cloakroom, and its window looked onto the weedy garden. Christopher expressed his feelings by slamming that door before I could take a photo. He plunged on to the door at the end of the passage. There were kitchens beyond that, two quite cosy-looking places with rocking chairs and big scrubbed tables, and some kind of a stove in the farther one. There was a scullery beyond that, which opened into a rainy yard with red tumble-down sheds all around it. By this time, even Christopher was having to admit that this house we were in was much, much smaller than the place with the double staircase. I don't understand it," he said, standing miserably beside the table in the second kitchen. "I didn't feel any change, did you?" He looked almost as if he might cry. I wished he would keep his voice down. There were definite signs that someone had been in this kitchen recently. Warmth was coming from the stove, and there was a bag of knitting on one of the rocking chairs. I could see crumbs on the table around a magazine of some kind, as if someone had been reading while they had breakfast. Maybe the change happened while you were shouting at Millie, I said very quietly to give Christopher a hint. He looked around at the stove, the knitting, and the table. This must be where Millie comes to eat, he said. Grant, you stay here in case she turns up. I'm going back up the stairs to see if she's there anywhere. Does Millie do much knitting? I asked. 
but he had dashed off again by then, and he didn't hear me. I sighed and sat in the chair by the table. It was clear to me, if not to Christopher, that the two staircases split apart somehow on the last spiral. Millie must have ended up somewhere as different from this house as the wooden tower was from Stollery. And I didn't like this house. People lived here. They had left furniture, coats and knitting about, and they might come back at any moment and accuse me of trespassing. I had no idea what I would say if they did. Ask if they'd seen Millie, perhaps? In order not to feel too nervous, I pulled the magazine across and looked through it while I waited for Christopher. It was quite, quite strange. So strange that it fascinated me. So very strange, in fact, that I was not surprised to find it was dated 1399, February issue. It could not have been anything like that old. It smelled new. It was printed on thick, furry paper in weird, washed-out blues and reds, in the kind of round, plain letters you get in books in infant school. Gossip Weekly, it was called. There were no photographs or advertisements in it at all, and it was full of quite long articles that had titles like From Rags to Riches, or Singer's Lost Honeymoon, or Scandal in Bank of Asia. Each article was illustrated by a drawing, blue and red drawings. I had never seen such bad drawings in my life. They were so bad that most of them looked like caricatures, though I could see that the artist had put in lots of red and blue shadings, trying to make the drawings look like real people. And here was the really queer thing. About half of them looked like people I knew. The lady at the top of Rags to Riches could almost have been Daisy Bolger, and one of the drawings for the bank scandal looked exactly like Uncle Alfred. But it must have been bad drawing. When I turned to the big picture beside an article called Royal Occasion, the picture looked like our king, except the caption called him Prince of Alpenholm. One of the courtiers bowing to him might almost have been Mr. Hugo. Now, come on, I thought. This is actually and truly a magazine from another world. For all I know, in this world, someone just like Hugo really is a royal courtier. How amazing! And I started reading about the royal occasion. I had got most of the way down one washed-out blue column without understanding what the occasion was or why it had happened, when I heard heavy, slow footsteps coming in through the scullery. They were the footsteps of a person you definitely did not want finding you sitting in their house. They stamped. There was angry puffing with them and bad-tempered grunting. I dropped the magazine and tried to slide quietly away into the father kitchen. Unfortunately, my foot knocked the chair as I slid out of it, and it scraped on the floor quite loudly. The person in the scullery put on speed and arrived in the doorway while I was still in the middle of the room. This is my evil fate at work again, I thought. She was a heavily built woman with a blunt mauve face. I could see at a glance she was the kind of woman who knows you're up to no good, even if you aren't, and calls the police. She had a rubber sheet over her head against the rain, and she was wearing big rubber boots and carrying a can of milk. And she was a witch. I knew this the moment she put the milk can down and said, Who are you? What are you doing here? I could feel the witchcraft buzzing off her as she spoke. A mistake, I said. Just going. I backed away toward the door as fast as I could. She came trudging toward me in her big boots with her hands hanging ready to grab. They always find me, she said. They send spies and they find me wherever I hide. She was saying this to make me think she was mad and harmless. I knew she was, because I could feel her casting a spell. It buzzed in my ears under her words until I could hardly think or see. So I did the only thing I could manage. I raised my camera and took her picture. 
She was nearer than I realized. The flash went off right in her face. She screamed, and her rubber sheet fell off as she put her hands up to hide her face. I heard her fall over the chair I had kicked as I pelted away through the other kitchen. I ran like mad through the corridor and out into the stone hall. I raced up those stone stairs, around and up, around and up, with the other set of stairs spinning dizzily past as I climbed until my breath was almost gone. But I still hardly slowed up when I met Christopher coming down. Run! I shrieked at him. There's a witch in that kitchen. Run! He said, We can do better than that, Grant, and seized hold of my elbow. Before I could shake him off, we were somehow at the top of the stairs in a strong buzzing of magic. This buzzing was somehow wider and cleaner feeling than the buzzing the witch had made. As Christopher pulled me by my elbow along the gallery, I remembered that he was supposed to be a nine-lived enchanter, which made me feel a little safer. But I didn't really feel safe until we came out through the archway into the smell of warm wood and plaster in the attics of Stollery. Phew! I began. Christopher said, In our room first, Grant, and turned me around. The archway had gone then, and we were able to scurry along the attic passages to our room, where we both sat heavily on our beds, me panting fit to burst, and Christopher all limp, white, and dejected. Tell, he said, with his head hanging. So I told him about the witch. Christopher's head came up, and he said, Hmm, I wonder if she's the reason Millie can't get out of there. Millie's an enchantress, you know. She ought to be able to leave. Instead, she seems to keep being shunted on to another probability. There was no sign of her on those stairs, and it could well be the witch doing it. We'd better go back and deal with the witch, then. He got up. I got up, too, although my legs were weak and shaking, and followed him out beyond the stripe of paint again. Christopher groaned when we got there. There was no archway, nothing but the ordinary attics we had just come through. We sat on the floorboards for quite some time, waiting, but there was no change. "'You panicked me, Grant,' Christopher said. "'We should have gone down, not up. Oh, damn it! We were so close!' "'It was probably my bad karma,' I said. "'Oh, don't talk nonsense,' he said. Let's go and look for secret books in the library. I'm sick of sitting here. One of the maids is going to see us breaking the rules if we're not careful. He was probably right. There seemed to be a lot of female noise coming from the other end of the attic suddenly, as if all the maids had arrived there at once. The empty space by the windows echoed to shrieks and giggles, and I could feel the floorboards creaking under me, the way they always did when everyone came up to bed. When we got up and went through our side of the attics, we found there was a fair amount of noise there, too. There were doors being slammed, running feet, and men laughing. A big, deep man's voice was singing inside the nearest bathroom. It was so out of tune that I giggled. Christopher raised his eyebrows at me. Gregor? he asked. Mr. Amos? I said. Christopher laughed then. It seemed to do him good. He was a lot more cheerful as we went down in the lift. He nodded at my camera, still hanging around my neck. Are you intending to photograph the books, Grant? No, I said. I'd need a different lens. I just forgot I'd got it. Why are we getting off at floor two? The library's on the ground floor. Ah, admire my forethought and cunning, Grant, Christopher said. That library has a sort of minstrel's gallery, and the door to it is on this floor. We can sneak in and make sure the Countess isn't in there consulting a cookery book or something. Ha ha, I said. I was glad Christopher had cheered up, but there were times when his jokes really annoyed me. But there was a woman in the library. 
When we softly opened the low wooden door and crept through onto a high balcony lined with shelves of books, we could see her through the carved wooden bars at the front of it. We both ducked down and knelt on the carpet, but she could have seen us through the bars even so. She was sitting at the top of a long wooden stepladder, reaching for a book on a high shelf. The one good thing was that she wasn't the countess, because she had dark hair. But that didn't alter the fact that she only needed to turn her head to see us there. I grabbed for the door, ready to crawl out through it at once. Never fear, Grant, Christopher said. I judged from the buzzing feeling I was getting that he had put a spell of invisibility around us on the spot. Then I gathered it was probably a spell of silence too, because Christopher first sat down comfortably with his arms around his knees, and then spoke in his normal voice. We wait, Grant, again. Honestly, Grant, I've never done so much waiting around as I have in this place. But she could be here for ages, I whispered. The stepladder was so close to the balcony that I couldn't help whispering. I think she must be the penniless student who's supposed to catalogue the books. Christopher looked critically through the bars of the balcony. She doesn't look penniless to me, he said. I had to admit that she didn't. She was wearing a dark blue dress that was both flowing around her and clinging to her in an expensive way, and her feet, hooked on a rung of the ladder, were in soft red boots, really nice ones. Her dark hair fell to her shoulders in the same sort of costly hairstyle that Lady Felice had. She's a friend of the family come to borrow a book, Christopher said. While he was saying it, the lady took down a book and opened it. She looked at the title page, nodded, and made a note on the pad on her knee. Then she leafed through the book, shut it, looked at the binding, and shook her head. She slipped some kind of card into the front and turned to put the book carefully into a box that was fastened to the back of the ladder. She was my sister, Anthea. I stood up. I couldn't help it. I nearly called out. I would have done if Christopher had not grabbed me and pulled me down. Someone else coming, he said. Chapter 13 Christopher was right. The big main door of the library opened, and Count Robert came in. He shut the door behind him and stood smiling up at my sister. Hello, love, he said. Are you on the job already? It was only a pretext, you know. And my sister, Anthea, cried out, Robert! and came galloping down the ladder. She flung herself into Count Robert's arms, and the two of them began hugging and kissing each other frantically. At this point, Christopher got cramp in one leg. I think it was embarrassment, really or it could have been running up and down those stairs. But it was real cramp. He whipped himself into a ball and rolled about, clutching his left calf, with his face in a wide grin of agony. I was forced to park my camera on the lowest bookshelf and lean over him, pounding and kneading at his striped silk leg. I could feel the muscles under the stocking in a hard ball, and you know how much that hurts. It used to happen to me after skiing sometimes. I tried to make Christopher take hold of his own foot and pull his toes upward, but he didn't seem to understand that this was the way to cure cramp. He just rolled and clutched. I kept glancing through the bars in case my sister or Count Robert had noticed us, but they didn't seem to. They were now leaning backward with their arms around each other's waists, laughing and saying, Darling, rather often. Ooh, ow! Oh, ow! Christopher went. Pull your toes! I kept whispering. Oh, ow! He said. Then use some magic, you fool! I said. I heard the main door open again and looked. This time it was Hugo who came in. He stood and smiled at Anthea too, all over his puggy face. Good to see you, Anthea, he said and then something that sounded like, 
join the club. But Christopher's knee hit my chin just then, and I went back to kneading. When I next looked, the three of them had gone to the leather chairs by the window, where Count Robert and Anthea each sat on the arm of the same chair, while Hugo leaned on the back of it. Hugo was talking quickly and urgently, and Count Robert and Anthea looked up at him and nodded anxiously at what he said. I wanted to know what Hugo was saying. I took hold of Christopher's ear, put my mouth to it, and more or less shouted, "Use some magic!" I said. That seemed to get through. There was some frantic buzzing. Then Christopher abruptly straightened out and lay with his face on the carpet, panting. "Oh, horrible!" he gasped, and deaf in one ear too. I looked down into the library again, in time to see Count Robert kiss Anthea and get up. Hugo kissed her too, a friendly kiss on one cheek, and they both turned to go. But the library door opened yet again. This time it was Mr. Amos who came in, looking anything but friendly. Christopher and I both froze. Has this young person got everything she requires? Mr. Ramos asked with truly dreadful politeness. "Well, not really," my sister said, cool as a cucumber. "I was just explaining that I need a computer if I'm to do this job properly." Hugo said with an anxious look, "I told you, Miss. Atmospheric conditions here in Stollery mean that your programming is liable to random changes." Count Robert turned to Mr. Ramos with his chin up, all lordly. Have we a computer, Amos? It was a splendid cover-up from all three. Mr. Amos gave Count Robert a small bow and said, "I believe so, my lord. I will see to it personally." Then he went away, very slow and stately. Count Robert and Hugo grinned at each other and then at Anthea. Hugo gave her a wink over his shoulder as he followed Count Robert out of the library. "Phew," said my sister. Then she swung around in a swirl of expensive skirt and came marching toward the balcony, looking really angry. "Come down out of there," she said. "Whoever you are." I hardly needed to look at Christopher's face, squashed against the carpet, to know that he had forgotten all about his spells of invisibility and silence from the moment he got cramp. I stood up. "Hello, Anthea," I said. She caught hold of the step ladder and stared. She was really astonished. "Conrad," she said. What on earth are you doing here, dressed like a lackey? I am a lackey, I said. But that's ridiculous, she said. You ought to be in school. Uncle Alfred said I could go to Stall High as soon as I had expiated my evil fate. I explained. What evil fate? What are you talking about? Come down here this instant and tell me properly, Anthea said. I had to smile. Anthea pointed over and over at the carpet in front of her as she gave her commands. It was so exactly what she used to do in the bookshop when she was annoyed with me that I felt almost happy as I climbed down the steep stair from the balcony. And your friend, Anthea commanded, jabbing her finger toward another place on the carpet. Christopher got up quite meekly and limped down the stair after me. Anthea looked from him to me. This is Christopher," I said. "He's a nine-lived enchanter, and he's here on false pretenses like I am." Really," Anthea said suspiciously. "Well, I felt someone doing magic, so I suppose that could be true. Now stand there, Conrad Testinich, and tell me all about this nonsense that Uncle Alfred's been putting into your head." "I knew it was nonsense," Christopher said, "but I thought his name was Grant." Are you his sister? You look quite alike. Yes. Shut up, you," Anthea said. Conrad. Christopher, to my surprise, did what Anthea said. He stood there attentively, looking slightly amused, 
while I told her what Uncle Alfred had said about my bad karma and how it was going to kill me unless I dealt with the person who was causing it. Anthea sighed and looked at the ceiling. So I told her that Mayor Suli and the rest of the magician's circle had seen my evil fate clinging to me too, and how they had given me the way to know the person responsible before Uncle Alfred sent me to Stollery. Anthea frowned heavily at this, and Christopher looked even more amused. But he seemed quite surprised when Anthea said, Oh, dear, I feel really guilty. I shouldn't have left you. And Mother? Didn't she even try to tell you Uncle Alfred was talking nonsense? She's always busy writing, I said uncomfortably. We never talked about my fate. And it isn't nonsense, is it? Mayor Suley thought it was true. Everyone knows he's a crook. He just wants his chance to make money the way Stollery does, my sister said. I think he lied to you, Conrad, in order to find out how to pull the probabilities himself. She looked from me to Christopher. Have you discovered yet who's doing it, and how? No, we both said. And Christopher asked, So it doesn't happen naturally, then? Some of it does, Anthea said. But someone is helping it along somehow. This is something Robert and I would really like to know about. It's one reason why I'm here. And what were you supposed to do, Conrad, when you found out who was doing it? Summon a walker, I said. Christopher and Anthea both looked utterly puzzled. They gave me this wine cork, I said, fetching it out. I was feeling awful by then. Stupid and taken in and, well, sort of pointless. If I didn't have a fate, then what was I? I felt worse when Christopher said, I did try to tell him he hasn't any bad karma. But he might have an awful lot if he does what Mayor Suley and Uncle Alfred seem to want, Anthea said. She gave me a worried, puzzled look. It made me feel worse than ever. Conrad, for goodness sake, what stopped Mother paying for you to go on at school? She hasn't any money, I said. Uncle Alfred owns the bookshop and... But he doesn't, Anthea exclaimed. Oh, I should have written and told you. I admit that puzzled me too. So I went and looked up Father's will in the record office as soon as I got to Ludwich, and he'd left the entire shop to Mother. What? All of it, I said. All of it, she said. And to you and me after that. He left Uncle Alfred some money, but that's all. Come to think of it, I do remember Father saying to me when he was dying that he hoped Alfred would take his money and go, because he didn't trust him as far as he could throw him. She tailed off in an uncertain way. Now why didn't I remember that before? She was looking vaguely at Christopher as she said this. He must have thought she was asking him, because he said, If he's a magician, this uncle, he could cast a selective forget spell quite easily. They're not difficult. He must have cast one, Anthea said, and went on decisively. Conrad, I'm going to ring Mother up. I was going to anyway, and this makes it urgent, and see what she says. There was a telephone in the corner of the library. Anthea marched across to it and dialed the number of our bookshop. I hurried after her and tried to listen in. Anthea turned the receiver so I could distantly hear a bored woman's voice say, Grant and test in itch. How can I help? Anthea mouthed at me, asking, Who? I said, Daisy, new assistant after you left. Anthea nodded. Could I speak to Franconia Grant, please? She said. Daisy said, Who? The famous feminist writer, Anthea said. I believe she married a Mr. Tezdinich, but we feminists don't mention that. Oh, Daisy went in the distance. I get you. Just a minute and I'll see if she's free. There were muffled footsteps running about and voices calling murkily. 
I heard Uncle Alfred faint and far off, saying, Not me, I don't have anything to do with those harpies. Finally there was a clatter, and my mother's voice said, Franconia Grant speaking. From then on it was much easier to hear. Christopher was leaning over us, wanting to hear too. Anthea said cheerfully, Hello, Mother, this is Anthea. My mother said, Good heavens, which was not surprising. It had been four years. I thought you'd left here for good, she added. I have, really, Anthea said, but I thought you ought to know when your daughter gets married. I don't believe it, my mother said. No daughter of mine would ever even think of enslaving herself to a male ethic. Well, I am, Anthea said. He's wonderful. I knew you'd disapprove, but I had to tell you. And how's Conrad? There was a blank pause on the other end of the line. My little brother, Anthea said. Remember? Oh, said my mother. Oh, yes. But he's not here now. He insisted on leaving school as soon as he was old enough, and he took a job right outside this district. I... Did Uncle Alfred tell you that? Anthea interrupted. No, of course not, my mother said. You know as well as I do that Alfred is a compulsive liar. He told me Conrad was staying on at school. I even signed the form, and then Conrad went off without a word, just like you did. I don't know what I've done to deserve two children like you. Then, while Anthea was trying to say that it was not true about me, at least, my mother suddenly snapped. Who is this wonderful man who has lured you into female bondage, Anthea? If you mean marriage, mother, Anthea said, it's Count Robert of Stollery. At this, my mother uttered something that sounded like that imposter, though it was more of a strange wailing yelp, and dropped the phone. We heard it clatter onto a hard surface. There was some kind of distant commotion then, until someone firmly put the phone back and cut us off. As Anthea hung the whirring receiver back on its rest, I had the hardest job in the world not to burst into tears. Tears pushed and welled at my eyes, and I had to stand rigid and stare at the shelves of books in front of me. They bulged and swam. I felt utterly let down and betrayed. Everyone had lied to me. By now I didn't even know what the truth was. Anthea put her arm around me hard. Christopher said, I know how you feel, Grant. Something a bit like this happened to me, too, once. Anthea asked him, Is our mother under a spell, do you think? She just doesn't care, I managed to say. No, Grant, I think it's a bit more complicated than that, Christopher said. Think of it as a mixture of lies and very small spells done by someone who knows her very well, and who knows she'll go where she's pushed if she's pushed often enough and gently enough. It sounds as if much the same was done to you, Grant. What's this walker you were supposed to summon? Why don't you try summoning it now and see what happens? The same dry-mouthed fear seized me that I had felt in the magician's circle. I was horrified. No, no! I cried out. I'm not supposed to do that until I know. No, what? My sister asked. The... the person who's the one who I should have killed in my last life, I stammered. I felt Anthea and Christopher look at each other across my head. Fear spell, Christopher said. And you don't know, do you, Grant? Then it's much safer to summon the thing now, before there's any real danger. Yes, do that. Do it at once, Conrad, Anthea said. I want to know what he's making you do. And you, she said to Christopher, if you really are an enchanter, you can stand guard on the door in case that butler comes back with a computer. Christopher's face was such a mixture of surprise and outrage that I nearly laughed. If I am an enchanter, he said, 
if. I've a good mind to turn you into a hippopotamus and see how Count Robert liked you then. But he went and stood with his shoulders against the door all the same, glowering at my sister. Summon away, Grant, he said. Do what the hippopotamus tells you. Anthea still had her arm around me. I won't let it hurt you, she said, just as if I were six years old again and she was putting plaster on my knee. I leaned on her as I took the wine-blotched cork out of my waistcoat pocket. I still felt miserably ashamed of myself for believing all those lies, but the dry-mouthed fear seemed to have gone. And the cork was so ordinary. It had Illery Wines, 1893, stamped on it, and it smelled faintly sour. I began to feel silly. I even wondered if the magician's circle had been playing a joke on me. But I pointed the cork at the end wall of the library and said, I hereby summon a walker. Come to me and give me what I need. I think it's a hoax, I added to Anthea. No, it isn't, Anthea said, sounding sharp and stern. Her arm went tight around my shoulders. There was a sudden feeling of vast, open distances. It was a very odd feeling, because the library was still all around us, close and warm, and filled with the quiet, mildewy scent of books. But the distances were there, too. I could smell them. They brought a sharp, icy smell, like the winds over frozen plains. Then I realized I could see the distance, too. Beyond the books, farther off than the edge of any world, there was a huge, curving horizon, faintly lit by an icy sunrise, and winds that I couldn't feel blew off it. I knew those were the winds of eternity. And real fear gripped me, nothing to do with any fear spell. Then I realized that I could see the walker coming. Across the huge horizon, lit from behind by the strange hidden sunlight, a dark figure came walking. He or she walked in an odd, hurried, careful way bending a little over the small thing it carried in both hands, as if whatever it was might spill or break if it was jogged in any way. So it walked smoothly but quickly in little steps, and the winds blew its hair and its clothes out sideways, except that the hair and the clothes never moved at all. On it came, and on. And all the time I could see the shelves of books in front of me, in ordinary daylight, and yet I could see the distance and the walker just as clearly. Anthea's arm was clamped around me. I could feel her trembling. Christopher's shoulders thumped against the library door as he tried to back away, and I heard him mutter, Gracious heavens! We all knew there was nothing we could do to stop the walker coming. It came nearer and nearer, with its strange, pattering strides, and the winds blew its clothes and its hair, and they still never moved, and it still bent over the small thing in its hands. When it was only yards away, and the room was filled with gusts of arctic scent that we could smell but not feel, I could have sworn the walker was taller than the library ceiling, and that was two stories high. But when it came right up to me, it was only a foot or so taller than Anthea. It was properly inside the room then, and I was numbed with the cold that I couldn't feel, only smell. It sort of bent over me. I saw a sweep of dark hair blown unmovingly away from a white face and long, dark eyes. The eyes looked at me intently as it held out one hand to me. I had never seen any eyes so intent. I knew as I looked back that this was because the walker was bound to get whatever it gave me exactly right, exactly right. But I had to give it the cork first, in exchange. I put the cork into the hand it was holding out. 
that hand closed around the cork, and the other hand came out and passed me something else, something cold as ice, and about twice as long and a good deal heavier. My face felt stiff and numb, but I managed to say, Thanks, in a mumbling sort of way. The intent white face in front of me nodded in reply once. Then the walker walked on past Anthea and me. All our breaths, Christopher's, Anthea's, and mine, came out in a whoosh of pure relief. As soon as the walker had gone past me, it had gone. The icy smell and the horizon of eternity had gone too, and the library was once more an enclosed, warm room. Christopher said, in a voice that was trying not to sound too awed, Was it a man or a woman? I couldn't tell at all. I'm not sure that applies to a being like that, Anthea said. What did it give you, comrade? I looked at the thing in my hand. It felt quite warm now, or only cold the way metal always feels. I looked at it and puzzled. It seemed to be a small corkscrew, very like the one I used to struggle with when the magician's circle wanted a bottle of port opened, one of those with an open handle that you hook two fingers through, with little curls at either side for two more fingers but there was a key sticking out from the top of the handle. If I held the thing one way up, it was a corkscrew, but if I turned it around, the corkscrew became the handle of the key. I held the thing up to Anthea and twiddled it at Christopher. Look, I'm supposed to need this. What do you think I'd do with it? Anthea leaned over me to look. It could be the key to a wine cellar. Christopher slapped the side of his velvet breeches. That's it! The hippopotamus has got it in one! I knew it was important to get into that wine cellar. Come on, Grant, let's go and do it before we have to go back on duty. He rushed off to the gallery staircase. I followed him slowly, feeling upset and puzzled, and let down. I had expected the walker to give me something much more dangerous than a key or a corkscrew. Get a move on, Conrad, Anthea said. That butler... So I hurried a bit, and lucky that I did. I had only just climbed into the gallery when the door below opened again. Mr. Amos came importantly in, followed by a line of footmen carrying a viewscreen, a tower, a keyboard, drums of flex, armloads of discs, a stack of power cells, a printer, boxes of paper, and a load of other accessories. I shall supervise the setting up of the equipment personally, miss, Mr. Amos said to Anthea. Christopher dragged me through the door at the back of the balcony. Good, he said, when we were safely out in the corridor. If he's busy in there, he can't possibly be in the wine cellar. Let's go, Grant. Teen. We galloped downstairs and down again to the undercroft. Funny, I said to Christopher as we tiptoed toward the stairs that led to the cellar. I didn't know any of those footmen with Mr. Amos, did you? Hush, he said. Utmost caution, Grant. Actually, there was no one about, and it was quite safe. Christopher was just being dramatic, because it was all so easy. There were nice, broad steps curving down to the cellar, and a light switch beside the door at the bottom, so that I could see to put the corkscrew key into the keyhole. The keyhole looked far too big, but the key went in, fitted exactly, and unlocked the door when I turned it. The door swung open easily and silently, and lights came on in the cellar as it opened. Lock it after you, Christopher said. No, I said, we may need to get out quickly. Christopher shrugged. I pushed the door shut, and we walked on into a set of low, cold rooms lined with wine racks and barrels. 
There were dusty bottles and shiny new bottles, rank on rank of them, little kegs labelled cognac in foreign letters, bigger barrels labelled Jerez that Christopher said meant sherry, and whole walls of champagne. One could get awfully drunk here, Christopher remarked, surveying a dusty wall of bottles marked Nuit d'été, 1848. I have quite a mind to drown my sorrows, Grant. I saw Millie. I talked to her. Do you know how to open champagne? Don't be a fool, I said. I pulled him away and led him on, and on, past thousands of bottles, until we came to another locked door in a wall at the end. Ah, said Christopher, this may be it, whatever it is. Does your gadget work on this door too? I tried the corkscrew key again, and it worked. This door creaked a bit as it opened, as if it were not used very much, and we saw why as soon as we were inside. Lights came on and showed another, newer-looking staircase that led to a trapdoor in the ceiling. Christopher looked up at the shiny new metal of the trapdoor very thoughtfully. I do believe, he said. That we may be right under the butler's pantry here, Grant. In which case, the important stuff is just round this corner. The walls here were of quite new brick. It looked as if an extra room had been built off at an angle to the main cellars. We edged around the corner to it. There we both stopped, quite bewildered. This room was lined, as closely as the wine cellars were lined with bottles, with lighted, flickering view screens. From floor to ceiling they were stacked in rows. Most were covered with green columns of figures that ran and jumped and changed all the time, but about a third of them, mostly on the end wall, were full of strange swirlings or coloured jagged shapes. The jumping and flickering made me seasick. Worse than that was the peculiar buzzing of magic in the room, electric and alien, and feeling like metal bars vibrating. I had to look at the floor for a while until I got used to it. But Christopher walked up and down the room, watching the screens with interest. "Do you understand this, Grant?" he asked. "No," I said. "I almost do," Christopher said. "But I'm going to need your help to be sure." He pointed to a screen of jumping numbers. For instance, what does Co. Smith mean? Stock market, I said. I think. Right, Christopher said triumphantly. He pointed to another screen where blue columns of numbers raced so fast that I couldn't read them. What's Buda Parich? That's a city, I said, over in the middle of the continent. It's where all the big banks are. And here's Ludwich, Christopher said at another screen. I know that one. More big banks and a stock exchange in Ludwich. Am I right? But there can't be a city called Metal Futures, can there? This lot of screens must be stocks and shares then. Yes, Chemex, heavy munitions, carbon products. It sort of makes sense. And he paused at a clump of screens where green and red lines zigzagged. Bent and climbed. These lot have to be graphs, but the really puzzling ones, he went on, moving around to the end wall, are these. They just seem to be patterns. What do you think this one is? The one that's all jagged, moving shapes. Fractals, I suggested. I wouldn't know a fractal if it jumped up and bit me, Christopher said. Which it almost looks as if it could do. Oh, look! These must be the controls. Under the possible fractals, there was a sloping metal console. Rows of buttons took up the top half of it. The bottom part held a very used-looking keyboard. The lights from the screens painted winding, coloured patterns on Christopher's attentive face as he leaned both hands on the edge of the console and stared at the rows of buttons. Interesting," he said. 
When controls are used a lot, you can see which the important ones are. This keyboard thingy is quite filthy with finger grease. Used every day, I should think. And this one on its own at the top has been used almost as much. His thin white finger pointed to a square button up on the right above all the others. The metal around this button was worn shiny and ribby, with a ring of grease around the shiny part. The label under it was all but worn away. As far as I could see, it said, Shift. That must be... I began. But Christopher turned to me, looking almost unholy in the coloured lights. What do you think? he said. Dare we, Grant? Dare we? No, we daren't, I said. Christopher simply grinned and pressed the used square button firmly down. We felt the shift like an earthquake down there. Our feet seemed to jerk sideways under us. All the screens blinked and began to flicker away madly in new configurations. Above the console, the strange patterns wove and writhed into quite different shapes and colours. Now you've done it, I said. Let's get out. Christopher made a face, but he nodded and began to tiptoe away from the console. I had just turned to follow him when a voice spoke. It was a woman's voice, very cultivated and rather deep. Amos, it said, and stopped both of us in our tracks. We stood, bent and on tiptoe, craning to look up at the round grid in the ceiling where the voice had come from. Amos, it said, do pay attention. I don't think we can afford to make changes at the moment. We may have trouble this end. I told you about the ratty little fellow we caught sneaking around the office. Security locked him up, but he must have been some kind of magic user, because he got away in the night. Amos, are you listening? Christopher and I waited for no more. I clutched his arm, and he grabbed my shoulder, and we bundled each other around the corner and out through the door. I could scarcely turn the corkscrew key in the lock for giggling. Christopher giggled too. It was the silly way you behave when you feel you have almost been caught. As we sped back past the ranks of wine, Christopher said in a giggling whimper, That was never the Countess, was it? No, I said. Mrs. Amos? A bit la da for that, Christopher said. We were still laughing when we came to the outer door, and I locked that after us, and we didn't really get a grip on ourselves until we came to the lobby of the Undercroft, and I tried to fit the corkscrew key into my waistcoat pocket. It wouldn't go. It was more than twice as long as the wine cork, and it stuck out whatever I did. Christopher said, Here, let me. He whipped a piece of string out of thin air, threaded it through the corkscrew handle, knotted the ends together, and hung the lot around my neck. Under your shirt with it, Grant, he said. While I was stuffing it out of sight under my cravat, Miss Semple came into the lobby, full speed ahead, striped skirts flying. I've been looking all over for you two, she said. You're eating in the middle hall from now on with the new stuff. She stopped, went back a step, and put her hands up in horror. She was the sort of person who did that. My Goodness, she said, go and get into clean uniforms at once. You've got two minutes. You'll be late for lunch, but it will serve you right. We fled up the undercroft steps and dodged into the staff toilets at the top. Christopher sagged against the nearest wall inside. This has been quite the busiest morning of my life, he said. Damned if I go all the way up to the attics again. This was my feeling, too. But when I looked over at the mirror, I saw why Miss Semple had been so horrified. We were both filthy. Christopher was covered in dust and carpet fluff. One of his stockings had come down, and his cravat looked like a grey string again. I had cobwebs all over me, and my hair stuck up. Then work some magic, I said. Christopher sighed and flapped one hand. There. 
and we were once more smart flunkies in crisp, clean shirts and neat cravats. Drained, he said. I'm exhausted, Grant. You forced me to do permanent magic on us. At this rate I shall be old before my time. I could see he was all right, really, but he kept saying this sort of thing all the way back into the undercroft. I didn't mind. Neither of us wanted to talk about the walker or about the screens in the cellar and the voice from the ceiling. It was all too big to face just then. We opened the door of the middle hall to find it almost entirely full of strangers, maids in yellow caps and footmen in waistcoats and striped stockings who all seemed more than usually good-looking. Andrew, Gregor, and the other footmen we knew were sitting in a row down at the end of the long, low room, staring in a stunned way. One of the best-looking maids was standing on the table among the glasses and cutlery. As we came in, she held one hand up dramatically and said, Oh, when, oh, when comes as your knight and brings my love to me? And a fellow in a dark suit who was kneeling on the floor between the chairs said, E'en before the twilight streaks the west with rose, I come, I come to thee. Most rash, replied the young lady on the table. Hey, said Christopher. Everyone jumped. Before I could believe it possible, every new maid and every strange footman was sitting demurely in a chair at the table, except for the man in the suit, who was standing up and pulling his coat sleeves down, and the girl, she really was very pretty, was still standing on the table. You rats, she cried out. You might have helped me down. Now I'm the one in trouble. It's all right, I said. We're only the improvers. Everyone relaxed. The man in the suit bowed to us. He was almost ridiculously tall and thin, with a sideways sort of hitch to his face. Prendergast, he said. Temporary underbutler. Temporary name, too, he added, hitching his face to the other side. My stage name is Boris Vestov. Perhaps you have heard of me. No, he said sadly, seeing Christopher looking as blank as I felt. I mostly play in the provinces anyway. We're all actors here, darlings, another good-looking maid explained. How? Why? Christopher said. I mean, because Mr. Amos is an extremely practical person, said the girl on the table. She knelt down and smiled at Christopher. She was blonde and face to face quite stunning. Christopher looked as stunned as Andrew and the rest. Her name, I found out, was Faye Marley, and she was a rising star. I'd seen her last year on a friend's television when I came to think about it. I nudged Christopher. It's true, I said. She was in bodies last year. So, he said, what has it got to do with Mr. Amos being practical? Faye Marley scrambled off the table and explained. They all explained. Nobody could have been friendlier than those actors. They laughed and joked and called us darling, and they went on explaining while the ordinary maids came in with lunch. The ordinary maids were full of giggles and goggles. They kept whispering to me or to Christopher, She's that young nurse in bodies, and he's the one who jumps through the window in the chocolate ad. And he was the lost elf in Chick Chack. Mr. Prendergast, Vestov, had more or less to push them out of the room. Anyway, it seemed that practical Mr. Amos had, a long time ago, made an agreement with the Actors' Union that when Stollery needed more maids or footmen in a hurry, he would hire any actors who were not at that moment working. Being out of work is something actors are quite often, a glamorous footman said. But the union makes strict conditions, a dark maid who was quite as glamorous told us. If we get stage or film work while we're here, we're allowed to leave Stollery at once. And we take our meals together, a beautiful parlour maid said. We're only allowed to work so many hours a day here. 
You'll be doing much longer hours than us, darlings. But, said Christopher, what makes you think you can do the work at all? They all laughed. There's not a soul among us, Mr. Prendergast told him, who has not at one time in his or her career walked onto a stage and said, Dinner is served, madam, or carried on a tray of coloured water and wine glasses. We know the part quite well. And we've a day or so to rehearse in anyway, said another glamorous footman. He was Francis, and fair-haired like Fay. I am told that the guests don't arrive until the ladies get back from Ludwich. They told us that they had all arrived by coach earlier that morning. Along with that lovely wench who's checking the library, a pretty parlour-maid added. I give my eye teeth for a complexion like that girl has. We got told this bit more than once. This was because there were at least two more of those sideways changes during lunch. At each one, the conversation did a sort of jolt and went back a few stages. Christopher began to look just a little guilty. He rolled his eyes at me each time, hoping I would not say anything. By the end of lunch he was quite quiet and anxious. Then the bell rang. Christopher and I had to go back on duty, along with Andrew, Gregor, and two of the actor footmen. And Mr. Amos was waiting at the top of the stairs, stubbing his cigar out in the usual place. I was sure he knew that we had been in his secret cellar. I almost ran away. Christopher went white. But it was the new footmen Mr. Amos wanted. He sent us on to the dining room ahead. Whatever Mr. Amos said to the actors, it made them very nervous. They were awful. They got in one another's way all the time. Francis broke two plates and Manfred fell over a chair. Andrew and Gregor were very scornful. And when the Countess came in, followed by Lady Felice and Count Robert, it was to the long clattering of knives pouring out of a drawer that Francis had pulled open too far. The Countess stopped and stared. She was all beautifully got up for her trip to Ludwich. I do beg pardon, my lady, Mr. Amos said. The new staff, you know. Is that what it was? Count Robert said. I thought it was a war. The Countess gave him a disgusted look and stalked to her chair, while Francis, redder in the face than I thought a person could be, crawled about, scooping knives out of her path. Mr. Amos nodded me and Christopher off to help him. I was crawling about on the floor, and Manfred had just managed to slop soup over half the knives, when there came the most majestic clanging from somewhere, like someone tolling for a funeral in a cathedral. The front door, Mr. Amos said. I beg you will excuse me, my ladies, my lord. Mr. Prendergast is not yet practised in his duties. He seized Andrew's arm and whispered, Put those two idiots against the wall until I get back. Then he fairly whirled out of the room. Gregor gave me a sharp kick typically, and made me serve the soup instead of Manfred. By the time I had given all three of them a bowlful, and the Countess, spoon poised at her lips, was saying, Now, Felice, dear, you and I are going to have a very serious talk about Mr. Sully on the way to Ludwich. Mr. Amos came hurrying back. He looked almost flustered. As he shut the door in his soundless way, I could hear the voice of Mr. Prendergast outside it. I tell you, I'm quite capable of opening a door, you pear-shaped freak. Everyone pretended not to hear. Mr. Amos came and bent over Count Robert. My lord, he said, there is a king's courier in the hall asking to speak with you. The countess's head snapped up. Her spoon clanged back into the soup. What's this? Asking to speak to Robert? What nonsense! She sprang up. Count Robert got up too. Sit down, she said to him. There must be some mistake. I'm in charge here. I'll speak to this courier. 
she pushed Count Robert aside and marched to the door. Manfred tried to make up for his mistakes by rushing to open it for her, but he slipped in the spilled soup and sat down with a thump. Christopher whisked the door open instead, and the Countess sailed out. Count Robert simply shrugged, and while Francis and Christopher were hauling Manfred up, he walked around the struggle and went to talk to Lady Felice. She was sitting with her head hanging, looking really miserable. I didn't hear most of what Count Robert said to her, but when Gregor shoved me over to wipe up the soup from the floor, the Count was saying, Bear up. Remember, she can't force you to marry anyone. You can say no at the altar, you know. Lady Felice looked up at him ruefully. I wouldn't bet on that, she said. Mother's a genius at getting her own way. I'll fix something, Count Robert said. The Countess came back then, very crisp and angry. Well, she said, such impertinence. I soon sent that man packing. What did he want, my lady? Mr. Amos asked. There's a royal commissioner coming to the district, the Countess said. They want me to entertain him as a guest at Stollery, of all things. I told the man it was out of the question and sent him away. Mr. Amos went a little white around his pear-shaped jowls. But, my lady, he said, this must have been a request from the king himself. I know, the countess said, as Andrew pulled her chair out for her, and she sat down. But the king has no right to interfere with my plans. Mr. Amos gulped. Forgive me, my lady, he said. It is mandatory for peers of the realm to extend hospitality to envoys of the king when required. We would not wish to annoy his majesty. Amos, said the countess, this person wishes to plant himself here in my mansion at the precise time when we have a house full of eminent guests. Lady Mary, the Count's fiancée, will be here with all her family and the people I have chosen to meet her. All the guest rooms will be full. The valets and ladies' maids will be filling both upper floors. This commissioner has a staff of ten and twenty security men. Where, pray, am I supposed to put them? In the stables? No, I told them to go to a hotel in Stolchester. My lady, I think that was most unwise, Mr. Amos said. The countess looked stonily at her soup, and then across to the chops Andrew was fetching from the food lift. I don't want this, she said. She slapped her napkin down and stood up again. Come, Felice, she said. We'll set off for Ludwich now. I'm not going to stay here and have my authority questioned all the time. Amos, tell them to bring the cars round to the door in five minutes. She and Lady Felice hurried away in a brisk clacking of heels. Suddenly everyone else was rushing about as well. Andrew raced off with a message to the garage. Christopher was sent to fetch the two ladies' maids who were going to Ludwich, too, and the other footmen rushed away to bring down the luggage. Mr. Amos, looking thunderously upset, turned to Count Robert. Will you wish to continue lunch now, my lord, or wait until the ladies have departed? Count Robert was leaning on the back of a chair, and I swear he was trying not to laugh. I think you should go and lie down, Amos, he said. Forget lunch. No one's hungry. Then, before Mr. Amos could send me off to the kitchens, he turned and beckoned me over to him. You, he said, go to the library and tell the young lady waiting there to meet me in the stable yard in ten minutes. As I left, he was giving Mr. Amos a sweet, blank smile. I found Anthea in the library, sitting rather crossly in front of a computer screen. They were quite right about the disturbances here, she said to me. Everything keeps hopping sideways, and when I get it back it says something quite different. When I gave her Count Robert's message, she jumped up, beaming. Oh, good! How do I find the stables in this barracks? I'll take you there, I said. 
We went the long way around, talking the whole way. I told her about the screens Christopher and I had found in the cellar. And I think your computer went wrong when Christopher pressed the shift button, I said. It felt magic to me. Very probably, she said. So it's that pear-shaped butler messing up the world's finance, is it? Thanks. Robert will be very glad to know that. How did you meet Count Robert? I asked. My sister smiled. At university, of course. And Hugo, too, though he was always popping off to visit Felice in her finishing school. I met Robert at a magic class on my first day, and we've been together ever since. But, I said, the Countess says Count Robert has to marry a Lady Mary something who's coming here soon. Anthea smiled happily and confidently. We'll see about that. You'll find Robert's just as strong-minded as his awful mother. So am I. I thought about this. And what do I do, Anthea? I can't stay on here as an improver, and Uncle Alfred won't let me go to school because I didn't use the cork like he said. Anyway, he'll know I know he's told me all those lies now. What do I do? It's all right, Conrad, Anthea said. Just hang on. Hang on and wait. Robert will make everything all right, I promise. Then we got to the stable yard, where Count Robert was waiting in his red sports car. My sister rushed over to it, waving happily. I went away. She had an awful lot of faith in him. I didn't. I couldn't see someone like Count Robert ever sorting out this mess. Anthea's faith was just love, really. In. The next couple of days were strange and hectic. I hardly saw Anthea, except when she was dashing away from the upper hall after breakfast. She was out with Count Robert in his sports car almost all the time. I don't think she went into that library at all. And Count Robert didn't come in to meals, so I never set eyes on him either. Hugo, now, he was another matter. I seemed to run into him everywhere, wandering about, missing Lady Felice. Because none of the family were using the dining room, Mr. Amos used it to train the actor footmen in. He had me and Christopher and Andrew and Gregor in there all that first afternoon, sitting at the table pretending to be family, so that Manfred and the rest could pour us water into wine glasses and hand us plates of dried fruit and cold custard. To do those actors justice, they learned quickly. By the evening, Francis only dropped one spoon the last time he served me with custard, and Manfred was the only one still falling over things. But none of us really fancied our supper. Christopher summed up my feelings, too, when he poked his potato cheese with a fork and said, You know, Grant, I find it hard not to see this as custard. The food turned into liver and cauliflower as he poked it. Christopher shot me a glum, guilty look. Since Mr. Amos had been giving the actors a hard time in the dining room all afternoon, we knew he had not been down to the cellar to push the shift button. So this change was Christopher's fault. I quite expected him to start persuading me to go to the cellar again with him that night. I was determined to say no. One time in that place was enough. The thought of its alien technological magics made my flesh creep, and the thought of Mr. Amos discovering us there was even worse. But all Christopher said was, Things must be changing like this where Millie is too. She could be lost for good if I don't get to her soon. And I half woke up in the night to hear him tiptoeing away to the forbidden part of the attics. I don't know how long he stayed out there, but he was very hard to wake in the morning. No luck? I asked, as we collected the shoes. Christopher shook his head. I don't understand it, Grant. There were no changes at all, and I sat there for hours. Here the lift opened, and we found it crowded with actors acting a scene from possession. 
This was the strange thing about actors. They loved acting so much that they did it all the time. They spoke in funny voices and imitated people if they didn't do scenes from plays. And the lift made a good place to act in, because Mr. Ramos and Mrs. Baldock couldn't see them at it there. From then on, the lift was always liable to have a scene going on in it, or someone saying, "No, darling, the best way to see the part is like this," and then doing it. In between, Hugo rode broodingly up and down, looking as if he did not want to be disturbed. Christopher and I got used to taking the stairs instead. The undercroft was crowded with the regular staff, up early in hopes of catching one or other of the actors. The maids had all got it badly for the footmen. Francis was most popular, and Manfred next because he looked dark and soulful. But even Mr. Prendergast got his share of giggles and fluttered eyelashes and shy requests for his autograph, and he was really odd-looking. It's something about grease paint, Grant," Christopher said. "It acts like a love potion. What did I tell you?" he added, as we ran into four of the regular footmen, Mr. Maxim and the boot boy, who all wanted to know if we had seen Fay Marley that morning. In the lift, Christopher told them, pretending to be possessed by a devil or something. Stollery echoed with rehearsals that day, not only actors acting. But with official ones, Mrs. Baldock and Miss Semple tore the maids away from the actor footmen and the actor maids out of the lift and drilled them all in their duties upstairs. Mr. Ramos took Mr. Prendergast and all the footmen to the hall, where he trained them in how to receive the guests. Mr. Smithers was roped in to pretend to be a guest, and sometimes Christopher was too. Christopher was good at grand entries. I was on the stairs mostly. Learning what to do with the dozens of empty suitcases Mr. Ramos had found to be luggage for the pretend guests, Mr. Ramos made me stack them in pairs in the lift and then take each one to the right bedroom. This always took ages. If Hugo was not in the lift, then it was two of the actresses looking exhausted. If I have to make one more bed or lay out one more breakfast tray, I shall drop, darling. Why does Miss Semple insist on counting everything? Does she think I'm a thief, darling? And when I arrived in the right bedroom with my empty luggage, Mrs. Baldock usually grabbed me and trained me in all the other things I might have to bring to people's bedrooms. I was made to carry in trays, newspapers, drinks, and towels. Mrs. Baldock seemed to think she had as much right to me as Mr. Amos did. I several times caught myself thinking that this must be my evil fate at work. In fact, I kept thinking it, and then realizing all over again that Uncle Alfred had probably invented it. It gave me a strange, hectic feeling at the back of my mind all day. On top of that, I kept waiting for Mr. Amos to discover that Christopher had pressed that shift button. Luckily, Mr. Amos was too busy in the hall just then. I came back to my station on the main stairs to find a full-scale rehearsal just starting. Right, go, Mr. Ramos shouted. He was standing in the middle of the hall, like the director of a film. The great doorbell solemnly clanged. At this signal, footmen in velvet breeches and striped waistcoats and stockings came rushing from behind the stairs and formed up in two slanting rows on either side of the front door. Like a flipping ballet, Mr. Prendergast said, gloomily standing beside me with his arms folded and too much wrist showing beyond the sleeves of his smart dark coat. Mr. Ramos paced solemnly toward the front door. He took hold of the handles. He stopped. He called over his shoulder, Prendergast, where are you this time? Coming, coming. Mr. Prendergast called back, walking slowly and importantly down the stairs. "Hurry it up, can't you?" Mr. Ramos boomed up at him. "Do you think you're the king or something?" Mr. Prendergast stopped. "Ah, no, indeed," he said. "It's these stairs, you see. No actor can ever resist a fine flight of stairs. 
you feel you have to make an entrance. Mr. Amos, for a second, seemed about to burst. Just hurry up, he said, slowly, quietly, and carefully. Mr. Prendergast went on down the stairs in a sort of royal loiter, and crossed the hall to stand behind Mr. Amos's left shoulder. My right shoulder, you fool! Mr. Amos practically snarled. Mr. Prendergast took two measured steps sideways. Now, said Mr. Amos, and threw open the two halves of the door. Francis jumped forward and grabbed one half, and Gregor took the other, and they each dragged their half wide open. Mr. Amos bowed. Mr. Prendergast did a much better bow, and Mr. Smithers edged apologetically indoors. Christopher followed him, airily strolling, looking every inch an important guest. But here, one of the sideways changes happened, and the show broke down. Everyone was suddenly in a different position, milling around, with Mr. Amos in the midst of the chaos almost screaming with rage. No, 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 Francis, why are you over there? Andrew, it is not your job to fetch luggage in. You take Mr. Smithers' coat. Mr. Amos really did not seem to see that there had been a change. It began to dawn on me that he might be as insensitive to the shifts as Mr. Maxim was. It was an odd thing, because Mr. Amos must have been some sort of a magician, and I would have thought he ought to have known when his own magic machinery was working, but I could see that he didn't. That was a relief. Christopher was looking at Mr. Amos consideringly, as if he was thinking the same thing as me. Beside him, Mr. Smithers stared around anxiously for the right footman to hand his imaginary coat to. Start again, Mr. Amos said, and try this time. I try, I try, Mr. Prendergast said, arriving beside me again. I am exercising every thew and sinew to persuade that man to give me the sack, but will he? Why? I said. The Union must have been right when they told me that a reasonable-looking underbutler was very hard to find at short notice, Mr. Prendergast said dolefully. No, I meant why do you want to be sacked, I said. Mr. Prendergast grabbed each of his elbows in the opposite hand and hitched his face mournfully sideways. I don't like the man, he said. I don't like this house. It strikes me as haunted. You mean the changes, I said. No, said Mr. Prendergast. I mean haunted, as in ghosts. And the strange thing was that by lunchtime everyone was saying that Stollery was haunted. Several agitated people told me that someone or something had thrown a whole shelf of books on the library floor. I tried to find Anthea to ask her, but she was out with Count Robert. By tea time, all the maids were saying that things in the bedrooms kept being moved. Some of them had heard strange hammerings and knockings there, too. By the end of the day, Mr. Prendergast was not the only actor who was talking about leaving. It's just the changes, Christopher said as we climbed the stairs that night. The lift was full of a courtroom drama just then, with Mr. Prendergast as the judge and a very glamorous dark girl called Polly Varden being accused of murdering Manfred. Actors are some of the most superstitious people there are. I'm glad Mr. Amos doesn't seem to notice the changes, I said. It is lucky, Christopher agreed. Here he began looking very anxious and raced ahead to the attics. He didn't go into our room at all. I think he spent all night out in the forbidden part of the attics. I woke up to find him already dressed and bending over me urgently. Grant, he said, there were no changes last night either. I think that fat swindler turns his machines off before he goes to bed. I'm going to have to look for Millie by day. Be an absolute cracker and cover up for me, will you? How do you mean? I asked sleepily. By saying I'm ill. 
Pretend I'm up here, covered in green and yellow spots. Please, Grant. Christopher had been learning from the actors. He went down on one knee and raised his hands to me as if he were praying. Pretty please, Grant. There's a witch out there, remember? I woke up enough to start thinking. It won't work, I said. Miss Semple is bound to come up and check on you, and when you're not there, I'll be in trouble too. Christopher went, Oh, desperately. No, wait, I said. The way to work it is for you to show Mrs. Baldock that you're really not well. Can't you work some magic to make yourself look ill? Give yourself bubonic plague or something? Then stagger into her room looking like death. Christopher stood up. Oh, he said. Thanks, Grant. I wasn't thinking, was I? It's easy, really. All I have to do is get hold of some silver, and Series 7 will do the rest. But you'll have to be the one who brings meals and medicines to my sickbed. Will you do that, Grant? All right, I said. So when we took the boots and shoes down, we took them by way of the big main staircase. There was no one about to see us at that hour. This made it all the more puzzling when we found a big red rubber ball, which must have come from the nurseries, bouncing slowly down the stairs in front of us. I wonder if there is a ghost after all, Christopher murmured. We were too busy with our plan to get hold of something silver to bother much about it. When the ball rolled away across the black marble floor of the hall, we simply dumped our baskets of footgear outside the breakfast room and sneaked in through the door. Christopher went on a rapid search of the sideboard in there. In no time he selected a very small silver spoon from one of the big cruet sets and stuffed it into his waistcoat pocket. This'll do, he said. The effect was almost instant. His face went bluish-white, and by the time he was back at the door, his legs were staggering. Perfect, he said. Come on. We dodged out into the hall again, where as far as I could see, the red rubber ball had vanished. But I didn't have any opportunity to look for it, because Christopher was now honestly and completely too weak to carry his basket. He panted and he wavered, and I had to carry one handle of it for him. Don't look so concerned, Grant, he told me irritably. It's only a sort of magical allergy. Actually, I was staring anxiously after the vanished rubber ball with shudders creeping up my back, but I didn't like to say so. I helped Christopher to the undercroft and to dump the baskets in the boot room and then to the middle hall for breakfast. By the time everyone else arrived there, he was looking like death warmed up. All the actors exclaimed. Fay Marley took Christopher along to Mrs. Baldock herself, and Mrs. Baldock believed he was at death's door like everyone else did. Christopher reappeared in the middle hall doorway, blue pale and staggering between Fay on one side and Mrs. Baldock on the other. I must have Grant, he gasped. Grant can take me upstairs. I knew he meant that we had to put the silver spoon back before Mr. Amos noticed it was missing. I jumped up at once and draped Christopher's arm artistically across my shoulders. Christopher collapsed against me so that I staggered too. To my surprise, everyone protested. You're not his servant, several actors said. Most of the others added, Let Fay help you take him. And Gregor said, I could probably carry him. Mrs. Baldock said anxiously, Are you sure you're strong enough, Conrad? He's a big lad. Let someone else try. Grant! Christopher insisted expiringly. Grant! Not to worry, I said. I can get him as far as the lift, and we can go up in that. They let us go, rather doubtfully. I heaved Christopher along to the lift, which was about as far as I could manage. Christopher was looking so unwell by then that I was quite alarmed. I took the spoon out of his waistcoat pocket and put it in mine before I opened the lift, in case anyone was listening for me to do that. 
Hugo was in the lift, sitting on the floor, with his arms around his knees, staring at nothing. So I shut the lift again. When I turned to Christopher, there was colour back in his face, and he was standing on his own. It was as quick as that. Keep tottering, I said, and we pretended to stagger to the lobby. We met Anthea there, dashing past us from the stairs. What's wrong with him? she wanted to know. Muscular dysfunctional debilitation, Christopher said. MDD, you know. I've had it from the cradle. You look pretty healthy to me, Anthea said. But she was, luckily, in too much of a hurry to ask any more. We tottered artificially on, up into the hall and across it to the breakfast room, where Christopher took a swift look around to make sure that nobody was there. You put it back, Grant, he said. I have to get going. And he went dashing away up the main stairs. I was a bit annoyed, but I sighed and slipped into the breakfast room. As soon as I was inside, I was quite positive there was a ghost in there. The room had a heavy, occupied feeling, and the air seemed thicker than it ought to be. It smelled of damp and dust instead of the usual coffee and bread smell. I stood for a moment wondering which was worse, facing a ghost or being accused of stealing the silver. Facing Mr. Amos, I thought, definitely worse. But my back shuddered all over when I finally made myself scuttle over to the sideboard. As quick as I could, I laid the shiny little spoon back where I thought it came from. There was a thudding sound behind me. I whirled around to see the big bowl of fruit in the middle of the table in the act of tipping over. The thud had been the orange that tipped out first. It was followed by apples, pears, nectarines, and more oranges, which went rolling across the table and off its edges, while the bowl stood on its edge to shake out a floppy bunch of grapes. Don't do that! I shouted. The bowl thumped back to its right position. Nothing else happened. I stood there for what must have been five minutes, feeling as if my hair was trying to pull itself up by its roots. Then I made myself scramble to pick up the fruit and put it back. I'm only doing this because of what Mr. Amos will say, I said, as I crawled after apples. I'm not helping you. Go and annoy Mr. Amos, not me. He's the one that needs a fright. I crammed the last handful of apples in anyhow, on top of the grapes, and then I ran. I don't remember anything on my way to the middle hall. I was too scared. The next thing I remember is being in the hall and being greeted merrily by the actors. Come and sit down, they called. We saved your breakfast. Do you want my sausage? Polly Varden said, I'm glad you're not ill too. We enjoy having you here, Conrad. But you're too humble with Christopher, you know, Fay Marley said. Why did it have to be you who hauled him to the attics? I couldn't answer that. All I could think of to say was, well, Christopher's, uh, special. No, he's not. No more than you are, Francis said. Darling, he just thinks of himself as a star, Fay said. Don't get taken in by the posing. And Mr. Prendergast explained, A person may have the quality, but he still has to earn his right to be a star, see? What has young Christopher done that makes him so special? It's more the way he was born, I said. They didn't like that, either. Mr. Prendergast said he didn't hold with aristocracy, and the rest said in different ways that it was work that made you a star. Polly made me really embarrassed by saying, But you don't put on airs, Conrad. We like you. I was quite glad when it was time to go and stand against the wall while Count Robert bolted his breakfast. He seemed to be in as much of a hurry as Anthea. The ghost was still in there. I think it was the ghost that made Manfred drop a steaming, squashy haddock on his feet. But it could have been Manfred on his own, of course. That morning, 
Mr. Amos had us all up on the ballroom floor. First in the great banqueting hall, learning how to lay it out for a formal dinner, and after that in the grand saloon, where he made half of us pretend to serve coffee and drinks to the other half. It did not go well. There was change after change, sideways jerk after sideways jerk, and each change caused someone to make a mistake. There was a golden footstool that turned up in so many places that even Mr. Amos noticed. I suppose it was hard to miss after Manfred had booted it across the room six times. Mr. Amos thought it was me playing practical jokes. No, no, you're wrong, the lad. Mr. Prendergast said, stepping up between me and Mr. Amos. There is a ghost in this place. You need an exorcist, not a lecture. You need a divine with bell, book, and candle. As I have played the part of a bishop many times, I would be happy to stand in the role of cleric and see what I could do. Mr. Amos gave him an even nastier look than he had been giving me. There has never, he said, been a ghost at Stollery, and there never will be. But he gave up lecturing me. Despite what Mr. Prendergast said, the maids told me that they thought the ghost had been busy in the bedrooms all morning, making loud thumps on the walls and rolling soap about. Mrs. Baldock had had to go and lie down. The maids were scared stiff, and they may have been right, and it may have been the ghost. The trouble was, it was so difficult to tell with all the changes. The sideways jerks seemed to be happening twice as often that day. The maids crowded around and told me all about it when I went to the kitchens at lunchtime to fetch a tray of food for Christopher. I had to push my way through them. I knew that if I didn't take the food to Christopher quickly, then Fay or Polly would tell me I was being too humble and take the tray up herself. And either she would find Christopher looking perfectly healthy. Or he would not be there at all. Mister Maxim handed me the tray with a wonderful domed silver cover on it and whispered, "You'll never guess. Mister Avonlock has gone missing. The garden staff don't know what to do." "You mean like the dog Champ?" I asked. "Just like that," Mister Maxim said. "A real mystery." He was loving it. I could see. I rushed off to the lift with the tray before any of the actors could start acting in there, and it was just as well I took it. Christopher was not in our room. There was no sign of him anywhere in the attics. I wondered what to do for a while. Then it occurred to me that the silver dome would make Christopher ill anyway, and so would the silver cutlery Mr. Maxim had given him. So I might as well eat the lunch myself. I sat on my bed and ate it all peacefully. I was finishing with the trifle when there was a really big sideways jerk. I sat there feeling a little sick, wondering if the trifle had changed into something else on the way down. As long as it wasn't sardines, I was thinking, when I heard footsteps clattering on bare boards in the distance. Christopher's back was my first rather guilty thought. I laid the tray on my bed and hurried out to explain that I had eaten his lunch, but he could pretend to get well and go down and eat mine. By the time I reached the bathroom on the corner, I could clearly hear that there were two separate sets of footsteps, one heavy and one lighter. He's found Milly, I thought. Now we're going to have problems. I shot anxiously through into the forbidden middle of the attics. Mr. Avonlock, the head gardener, was there, along with the new gardener's boy Smedley. They were clattering around, both of them looking tired, sweaty, and bewildered. Now where have we got to? Mr. Avonlock was saying in an angry sort of moan. This is different again. Smedley saw me. He shook Mr. Avonlock's earthy tweed sleeve. Sir, sir, there's Conrad. We must be back in Stollery. His face was bright red, and he was almost crying in his relief. This is Stollery, isn't it? He implored me. Yes, of course it is. I said. Why? Where have you been? I had a fair idea, of course. After morning outside a ruined castle, 
Mr. Avonlock said disgustedly. With a lake to it, all weeds. Ought to have been drained and replanted years ago. But I suppose there was no one there to do it. Can you show us the way down from here, boy? I was only ever in the undercroft before now. Certainly, I said, in my best flunky manner. This way. I took them along toward the lift, collecting the tray on the way. They thumped along after me in their great crusty boots. It wasn't only a castle, Smedley said. It was never the same castle anyway. It kept turning different. Then it was a huge place made of glass. All cracked and dirty, said Mr. Avonlock. Such neglect I never saw. And after that there were three palaces with white marble everywhere, Smedley chattered on. I knew how he felt. He had been having the sort of experience you just have to talk about. And then there was this great enormous brick mansion, and when we went inside it kept changing all the time. Stairs in all directions, old furniture, ballrooms. Didn't you see any people at all? I asked, hoping to get news of Christopher. Only the one, Mr. Avonlock said repressively, and she in the distance all the time. I could see he thought Smedley was talking too much. I thought nervously of the witch. What, like an old woman in rubber boots? I asked. She seemed like a young girl to me, Mr. Avonlock replied, and ran like a hare when we called out to her. That was what brought us up here, Smedley explained. She ran away upstairs in a mansion. Well, it was more like a cathedral by then, and we chased up after her, wanted to know what was happening and how to get out of there. We were at the lift by then. Its door slid aside to show Mr. Prendergast pretending to be Mr. Amos. I hadn't realised that Mr. Prendergast was such a good actor. He was tall and thin, and Mr. Amos was short and wide. But he had Mr. Amos's way of holding his head back and slowly waving one hand so exactly that I almost saw him as pear-shaped. Mr. Avonlock and Smedley both gaped at him. Lunch is served, Mr. Prendergast said. I require you to be furniture against the wall, furniture with legs of flesh. Then he did a Mr. Amos stare at Mr. Avonlock and Smedley. And what are you doing with a rake and a wheelbarrow, Conrad, may I ask? It's a long story, I said. Hugo was in the lift, too, behind Mr. Prendergast, grinning all over his face. Can we come down in the lift with you? I asked. Feel free, Hugo said. He came up looking for you anyway. Mr. Prendergast waved the two gardeners into the lift, like Mr. Amos ushering the countess. Enter. It is not your place to wait upon your fellow improver, Conrad, he said to me. And I really felt for a moment as if it were Mr. Amos telling me off. Enter. And place the rake in that corner, and the wheelbarrow by the wall there. Hold your tray two inches higher. We will now descend. He pressed the lift button with a Mr. Amos flourish. I will now, he said, make use of our descent to instruct you upon the correct way to place chairs for a banquet. All chair legs must be exactly in line. Having placed them at the table, you must then crawl along behind them, measuring the distance of chair from chair with a tape measure carried in the waistcoat pocket for the purpose. He went on like this all the way down to the undercroft. Smedley could not help giggling, and kept getting a Mr. Amos glare, followed by, Know your place, wheelbarrow. And even Mr. Avonlock began to grin after a while. Hugo was laughing as much as I was. When we got to the undercroft, Mr. Prendergast announced, Mr. Hugo will now repair to the upper hall, while I march Conrad off to his fate in the middle hall. You two implements. Please, sir, Smedley interrupted imploringly. Have we missed our lunch, sir? Take this tray, Mr. Prendergast said, removing it from me and dumping it on Smedley. 
and proceed with your mentor to the kitchens, where you will find they have been anxiously awaiting your return. Off with you now. He pretended to look at his watch. You have exactly two minutes before they feed your lunch to the dogs. Smedley went racing off. Mr. Avonlock paused to say, "That was as good as a play, but don't let Mr. Amos catch you at it. You'd be in for it then. It's probably the one thing he wouldn't forgive me for." Mr. Prendergast agreed cheerfully, which is why I am rehearsing the part. Come, Conrad. Your lunch awaits. I had to have another lunch. They really did not like me running after Christopher, and I really could not explain. I was half asleep for the rest of the afternoon until around supper time, when I was suddenly ravenous and wide awake, and I don't know why, I was quite convinced that Christopher was back. I sneaked off early to the kitchens and asked them to give me Christopher's tray now. I did not want Mr. Prendergast butting in again. It was so early that the regular maids were all gathering there for their high tea. They told me that the ghost had been bouncing that red rubber ball up and down the corridors all afternoon. They weren't frightened by then. They said, just annoyed by it. Besides, who wanted to leave? One of them added, when there was a chance of getting to know Francis. Oh, Manfred," said another. A third one said, "Yes, if you want gravy poured down your neck," and they all shrieked with laughter. The men's end of the attics seemed very quiet after this. I went along to our room and got the door open, which is not easy when you're carrying a tray, and Christopher seemed to be there. At least he was in bed and asleep when I went in. But when I turned around from putting the tray on the chest of drawers, there was no one there. The bed was flat, and empty. Oh, come on! I said, "Don't be stupid. It's only me." What happened? Didn't you find Milly then? A girl's voice answered, "Oh dear, what's gone wrong? You're not Christopher." I spun about. Looking for where the voice came from, Christopher's bed was still flat and unused, but there was a dip in the edge of my bed, the sort of dent a person makes sitting on the very edge. She was obviously very nervous. I said, "It's all right. I'm Conrad. I work here at Stollery with Christopher. You're Milly, aren't you?" He said, "You were an enchantress." She became visible rather slowly, first as a sort of wobble in the air, then as a blur that gently hardened into the shape of a girl. I think she was ready to whip herself invisible again and run away if I seemed to be hostile. She was just a girl, nothing like as glamorous as Fay or Polly, and a bit younger than Christopher. She had straight brown hair and a round face and a very direct way of looking at a person. I thought she seemed nice. Not that good an enchantress," she said ruefully. "You're that boy who was with Christopher on those stairs, aren't you? I made a real mistake getting into all those mansions. There never seemed to be a way to get outside them. It may have been the witch keeping you in," I said. "Oh, it was," she said. "I didn't realize at first. She was sort of kind." And she had food cooked, whatever kitchen I got to, and she kept hinting that she knew all about the way the buildings changed. She said she'd show me the way out when things were ready. Then she suddenly disappeared, and as soon as she was gone, I realized that it was that knitting of hers. She was sort of knitting me in, trying to take me over. I think I had to spend a day undoing her knitting before I could get anywhere. How did you get here? I asked. Christopher shouted across those double stairs to go to the top and then find the room with his tie on the doorknob. Milly said, "I was so tired by then that I did." Then he's still out there," I said. Milly shrugged. "I suppose so. He'll be back in the end. He's good at that kind of thing, having nine lives and so on." She seemed a bit cool about it. 
I began to wonder if the witch had grabbed Christopher instead, because he was stronger, and that this was how Millie got out. Oh, well, I said, he's not here, and you are. He's supposed to be ill, and I'm supposed to bring his meals. Would you like this supper now I've brought it? Millie brightened up wonderfully. Yes, please. I don't know when I've ever been so hungry. So I passed her the tray. She arranged it on the bedside table, which she pulled in front of the bed, and began to eat heartily. The food changed from egg and chips to cottage pie while she ate, but she hardly seemed to notice. I had nothing to buy food with, you see, she explained, and the witch only did breakfast. The last breakfast was days ago. Did you run away from school without any money then? I asked. Pretty well, Millie said. Money from series twelve wouldn't work in series seven, so I only took what was in my pocket. I was going to be a parlour maid and earn some money, except when I got inside those mansions, there was nobody there to be a maid for. But, she looked at me very earnestly. I could tell she was wanting me to believe the next bit particularly. But I had to run away from that school. It really was an awful place. Awful girls, awful teachers. And the lessons were all things like dancing and deportment and embroidery, and how to make conversation with an ambassador and so on. I told Gabriel DeWitt that I was miserable and not learning a thing, but he just thought I was being silly. And you told Christopher, I said. In the end, Millie said, only as a last resort. Gabriel never listens to him either. And Christopher was just as overbearing as I knew he would be. You know. My dear Millie, set your mind at rest, and I will fix it. And this time he was worse. He decided we were going to go and live together on an island in series five. And when I said I wasn't sure I wanted to go and live all alone with Christopher, well, would you want to, Conrad? No, I said very definitely. He's far too fond of his own way. And the way he makes superior jokes all the time, I want to hit him. Oh, doesn't he just? Millie said. After that, all the while Millie was eating the pudding, which started as jam roly poly and then became chocolate meringue, we both tore Christopher's character to shreds. It was wonderful fun. Millie, from having known Christopher for years, found two faults in him where I only knew one. His clothes, she told me. He fussed about his clothes being perfect all the time. He'd been like that for three years now. He drove everyone in Crestomancy Castle mad by insisting on silk shirts and exactly the right kind of pajamas. And he could get them right anyway by magic, Millie told me, if he wasn't too lazy to learn how. He is lazy, you know. He hates having to learn facts. He knows he can get by just pretending to know, bluffing, you know. But the thing that really annoys me is the way he never bothers to learn a person's name. If a person isn't important to him, he always forgets their name. When Millie said this, I realized that Christopher had never once forgotten my name, even if it was an alias. It suddenly seemed to me to be rather mean, talking about Christopher's faults when he wasn't here to defend himself. Yes, I said, but I've never known him do anything really nasty. I think he's all right underneath, and he makes me laugh. Oh, me too, Millie agreed. I do like him, but you can't deny that he's maddening a lot of the time. Who's that? It was Mr. Prendergast again. We could hear him outside in the corridor, doing his Mr. Amos act. Grant, he called out. Conrad, stop lurking in sick rooms and descend to the undercroft immediately. Supper is being served. He was nearer than we realized. The next moment, he flung the door open and stood looming in the doorway. Millie made a sort of movement as if she was thinking of turning invisible, but then realized that it was too late. And stood up instead. Mr. Prendergast hitched his face sideways at her, and his eyebrows travelled up and down his forehead like two sliding mice. He looked at me, 
and then at the tray. What is this? he said. Is Christopher really a girl? No, no, I said. This is Millie. She's not another wheelbarrow, Mr. Prendergast said. Is she? And when Millie simply looked completely confused, he narrowed his eyes at her and said, So where are you from, young lady? For a moment, he looked so utterly serious that he made goosebumps come up on my arms. Millie probably felt the same. Uh, from series twelve, really, she admitted. Then I think I don't want to know, Mr. Prendergast said. He hitched his face the other way, and I remembered with great relief that he was simply a very good actor. I think, he said to me, that she'd better be a feather duster. What are you talking about? Millie said, exasperated and frightened, but almost laughing, too. That was the effect Mr. Prendergast seemed to have on people. We can't have Conrad embarrassed, he said to her. And he would be if you went on sharing his room like this. So I think you'd better come downstairs and get turned into another new housemaid. Luckily, there are so many just now that one more will hardly be noticed. Come along to the lift, both of you. No, let her carry the tray, Conrad. It makes her look the part more. Hardly able to believe it, we followed Mr. Prendergast to the lift. Hugo was in it. He stared at Millie with gloomy surprise. New feather duster, Mr. Prendergast told him airily. She's the child star of Baby Bunting. You won't know it yet. It's on trial in the provinces. But it'll be a hit, I assure you. Millie went bright red and gazed hard at her tray, biting her lip. I think she was trying not to laugh. Mr. Prendergast said nothing more until the lift was nearly at the undercroft. Then he said suddenly, By the way, where is Christopher? Around, I said. Millie added, He went to the bathroom. Ah, said Mr. Prendergast, indeed. That accounts for it, then. Rather to my surprise, he didn't ask any more. He just stalked with us to the middle hall, where he took Faye aside and murmured a few words to her. It was like magic, really. Fay and Polly and two other girls instantly took charge and hurried Millie off to the maid's cloakroom. When they came back, Millie was wearing a brown and gold striped dress, just like the other girls, and a proper maid's cap. She sat and chatted to them and the other actors while the rest of us had supper. Fay and Polly must have found somewhere for Millie to sleep that night. When I saw her at breakfast the next morning, she had her hair up on top of her head under her cap, and Fay or someone had done things to her face with clever makeup. So that Millie looked rather different and quite a bit older. I think she was enjoying herself. She had a surprised, happy look whenever I saw her. I kept out of Millie's way on the whole. I dreaded the moment when Miss Semple spotted Millie. Miss Semple's mild, serious, distracted eyes didn't miss much, and I was sure she would realize that Millie was not a real maid before long. Then the fat would be in the fire, and Mr. Prendergast would probably get the sack. I was fairly sure he had made Millie into a feather duster in order to get sacked. But Miss Semple, nor Mrs. Baldock, did not notice Millie all day. Some of the reason was the ghost. It distracted people by playing pranks, dragging the sheets off all the newly made beds on the nursery floor, smashing tooth glasses, and bouncing that red rubber ball down flights of stairs. It had done something new every time Mrs. Baldock took me over to train me upstairs. But some of the distraction was due to the changes Christopher had started by pressing that button in the cellar. Everything kept moving about, so that when you put something down and then turned around to pick it up again, it wasn't where you'd left it. Most people who noticed, and it was hard not to notice before long, thought this was the ghost's doing too. They just sighed. Even when all the sheets and towels got shifted to quite different cupboards on different floors, they said it was the ghost again, and sighed. But no one could blame the ghost when late in the afternoon all our uniforms suddenly changed colour. Instead of gold and brown stripes, 
we were suddenly wearing bright apple green and cream. Miss Semple was really distressed by that change. Oh, Conrad, she said, what is going on? These are the colours we had in my mother's day. My mother changed them because they were thought to be unlucky. Green is, you know. Things had gone wrong then until Stollery had barely enough money to buy the new colours. Oh, I do hope we aren't in for any more bad luck, she said, and went rushing off past me in her usual way. We were all still rushing about, exclaiming, when the Countess and Lady Felice came back unexpectedly. Dean. The Countess and Lady Felice were not expected until the next morning, just before all the guests arrived. But they had finished their shopping early, it seemed, and now there they were, in three cars, drawing up outside the great front entrance. Their arrival caused a general stampede. I had just arrived in the kitchens for my cookery lesson, but Mr. Maxim sent me away again, because he had to help get together a proper dinner for the ladies in a hurry. He told me to go and help in the hall instead. Hugo shot out of the lift as I went by, and raced to the garage to find out where Count Robert had gone with Anthea, and to get him back if he could. In the black-floored hall there was the main stampede, for what Mr. Prendergast called the dress rehearsal for the real show tomorrow. Footmen raced down from the attics and up from the undercroft, and the marvel was that we all arrived there just as Mr. Amos, with Mr. Prendergast haunting his right shoulder like a skinny black scarecrow, threw open the huge front doors, and Francis and Andrew pulled them wide. The Countess sailed inside with a new fur wrap trailing from her shoulders. As she handed the wrap off to Manfred, she gazed around at us all with gracious satisfaction. But she seemed, for a second, a little puzzled to see us all in our green and cream stripes. Amos, she began. Mr. Amos said, Yes, my lady? I forgot what I was going to say, said the Countess. Evidently, she was as insensitive to the changes as Mr. Amos was. Has all been well? Naturally, my lady, said Mr. Amos. He turned and looked at the red rubber ball that came trundling out of the library as he spoke. Then he looked at me. I picked it up, and it felt just as if I was wrenching the ball out of someone's resisting hand. I shuddered and shoved it into the library and shut the door on it. Then where is Count Robert? the Countess demanded. Mr. Hugo is currently searching for him, my lady. Mr. Amos replied. Oh, the Countess said ominously. She marched away to the stairs, saying, See to the luggage, will you, Amos? It needed all of us to see to it. The three cars were stuffed with boxes, carrier bags, and parcels. I could not believe that two ladies could have bought so much in such a short time though I suppose there were four ladies at it, really. The two ladies' maids came in with armfuls of parcels and made a great pother about things being handled gently and being carried right way up. You could see they had been enjoying themselves. But Lady Felice, who hurried through while we were all handing parcels and carrier bags along like a bucket chain, did not look happy. She kept her head down, but I could see she had been crying. She still looked that way when I was waiting on the family at dinner that night. This was such a magnificent meal that you would never have guessed that the great dictator and Mr. Maxim had been taken by surprise like the rest of us, and had, so Mr. Maxim told me, made it up as they went along, wrestling also with the way chickens became salmon and cream became parsley as the food was fetched to the kitchens. The changes were quite bad that evening. You know, I never notice, Mr. Maxim told me, but Chef does, and he sorrowed, Conrad. It struck me as a pity that neither Lady Felice nor Count Robert seemed to feel much like eating. 
Count Robert, who arrived back from some inn outside Stolsted, had certainly had supper with my sister before Hugo found him. He pushed food about on his plate, while the Countess told him that he should have been in the hall to meet her, and how discourteous he was not to be there. He didn't even point out that she had come home a day early. But he stopped even pretending to eat when she went on to describe all the things he was expected to do and say when Lady Mary Ogworth arrived tomorrow. So much for Anthea's chances, I thought, standing against the wall on my own. Christopher was still missing, and I was beginning to worry about him. With all these changes happening, he could be in castles and towers and mansions, moving farther and farther away from Stollery all the time. And if the witch had not caught him yet, she would catch him if he was stuck out there again when Mr. Amos turned his machines off for the night. But there seemed nothing I could do. As for Felice, I heard the Countess say, the very least I insist on is that she be polite to Mr. Sully. At this, Lady Felice threw her fork down with a clatter. Count Robert leaned forward. Mother, he said, does this mean that you've made some kind of arrangement for this Mr. Sully to marry Felice? Of course, dear, said the Countess. We called on him on our way to Ludwich, and we had a long talk. He has made a very handsome offer for Felice, financially speaking. As if I was a horse! Lady Felice said violently. The Countess ignored this. As I keep telling Felice, she said, Mr. Sully is even richer than Lady Mary Ogworth. Then, said Count Robert, why don't you marry him yourself? This caused an astonished silence. Mr. Amos stared, the Countess stared. Gregor's mouth came open, and even Lady Felice raised her face and looked at her brother as if she could not believe her ears. At length the Countess said, in a fading, reproachful whisper, Robert, what a thing to say! You said it first to Felice, Count Robert pointed out. And before the Countess could pull her wits together, he went on, Tell me, mother, why are you so very set on your children marrying for money? Why? gasped the Countess, with her eyes very wide and blue. Why? But, Robert, I only want the best for you both. I want to see you properly settled, with plenty of money, naturally, so that if anything happens, you'll both be all right. What do you mean, if anything happens? Count Robert demanded. What do you imagine might happen? The Countess looked to one side and then to the other, and seemed not to know how to answer this. Well, dear, she said finally, all sorts of things might happen. We might lose all our money, or... or... This is a very uncertain world, Robert, and you know Mother knows best. She was so much in earnest saying this that big tears trembled on the ends of her eyelashes. You've hurt me very much, she said. My heart bleeds, Count Robert answered. At all events, the Countess said in a sort of imploring shriek, you have to promise me, darlings, both of you, to behave properly to our guests. You can count on us to behave, Count Robert said, but neither of us is going to promise more than that. Is that clear? I knew I could count on you, the Countess announced. She smiled lovingly from Count Robert to Lady Felice. They both looked confused. I didn't blame them. It was really hard to tell what anyone had promised by then. I looked at Mr. Amos to see what he thought. He was scowling, but that might have been because he could see a speck of dust on the glass he was holding to the light. I wished Christopher were there. He would have known what was going on underneath this talk. But Christopher was not there that night, and he did not turn up in the morning either. I had to make two journeys to collect all the boots and shoes. I was annoyed. After that, I was working almost too hard to remember Christopher, but not quite. 
People are wrong when they say things like, I didn't have time to think. If you're really worried or really miserable, those feelings come welling up around the edges of the other things you're doing, so that you're in the feelings even when you're working hard at something else. I was thinking and feeling a lot all the time the guests were arriving. Thinking about Christopher, worrying about Anthea, and feeling for myself stuck here without even an evil fate to account for what I was doing. The guests began arriving from early afternoon onward. Very stately people rolled up to the front doors in big cars and came in past the lines of footmen, wearing such expensive clothes that it seemed like a fashion parade in the hall. Then Mr. Prendergast would give out calls of, Lady Clifton's luggage to the lilac room, or the Duke of Almond's cases to the yellow suite and I would be rushing after Andrew and Gregor, or Francis and Manfred, with a heavy leather suitcase in each hand. When no guests were arriving, Mr. Amos had us measuring the spaces between the chairs at the banquet table to make sure they were evenly spaced. He really did that, and I thought Mr. Prendergast had been joking. Then the bells would clang, and it would be back to the black marble hall to carry more luggage. And all the time I was more miserable and wishing Christopher would get back. Millie was quite as worried about him by then, too. I kept meeting her racing past with trays or piles of clothes. Each time she said, Is Christopher back yet? And I said, No. Then, as things got more and more frantic, Millie simply said, Is Christopher? And I shook my head. By the middle of the afternoon, Millie was just giving me a look as we shot past each other, and I hardly had time even to shake my head. This was when Lady Mary Ogworth arrived. She came with her mother, who reminded me more than a little of the Countess, to tell the truth. Both of them were wearing floaty sort of summer coats, but the mother looked just like another guest in hers. Lady Mary was beautiful. Up till then, I'd never expected to see anyone who was better looking than Faye Marley, but believe me, Lady Mary was. She had a mass of feathery, white, fair curls, which made her small face look tiny and her big, dark blue eyes look enormous. She walked like a willow tree in a breeze, with her coat sort of drifting around her, and her figure was perfect. Most of the footmen around me gasped when they saw her, and Gregor actually gave out a little moan. That was how beautiful Lady Mary was. Count Robert was in the hall to meet her. He had been hanging about beside Mr. Prendergast on the stairs, fidgeting and shuffling and pulling down his cuffs, exactly like a bridegroom waiting by the altar for the bride. As soon as he saw Lady Mary, he rushed down the stairs and across the hall, where he took Lady Mary's hand and actually kissed it. Welcome, he said in a choky sort of way. Welcome to Stollery, Mary. Lady Mary kept her head shyly bent and whispered something in reply. Then Count Robert said, Let me show you to your rooms. And he took her, still holding her hand across the hall and away up the stairs. He was smiling at her all the way. Gregor had to poke me in the back to remind me to pick up my share of her luggage. I was staring after them, feeling horrible. Anthea doesn't have a chance, I thought. She's deluding herself. Count Robert has simply been fooling about with her. As soon as I dumped the suitcases, I sneaked to the library to find my sister. But she wasn't there. The ghost was. A book sailed at my head as soon as my face was around the door, but there was no sign of Anthea. I dodged the book and shut the door. Then I went to look for Anthea in the undercroft, but she was nowhere there either. And the undercroft was in an uproar because Lady Mary never stopped ringing her bell. Honestly, darling, Polly said, flying past, you'd think we'd put her in a pigsty. Nothing's right for that woman. The water, the sheets, the chairs, the mattress, Faye panted, flying past the other way. This time it was the towels. Last time it was the soap. 
We've all been up there at least six times. Millie's up there now. Miss Semple rushed down the stairs to the lobby, saying, "Mr. Hugo's fixed her shower. He thinks, but." Then the bell labelled "Ladies" rang again, and they all cried out, "Oh, what is it now?" Miss Semple got to the phone first and made soothing "Yes, madams" into it. She turned away in despair. Oh, I do declare, there's a spider in her water carafe now. Fay, no, you're finding her more shoe trees, aren't you? Her mild, all-seeing eye fell on me. Conrad, fetch a clean carafe and glasses and take them up to the lady suite on one of the best gilt trays, please. Hurry. If I had been Christopher, I thought. I would have found an amusing way to say that my arms had come out of their sockets from carrying luggage. As I was just me, I sighed and went to the glass pantry beside the green cloth door. While I loaded a tray with glittering clean glassware and took it up in the lift, I decided it must be the changes that were upsetting Lady Mary. They were going on remorselessly now. Before I got to the second floor, the lift stopped being brown inside and became pale yellow. It was enough to upset anyone who wasn't used to it. The lift stopped and the door slid back. Millie, still looking very smart and grown up in her maid's uniform, was waiting outside to go back down. She gave me another of her expressive looks. No, I said, still no sign of Christopher. I didn't mean that this time," Millie said. "Are you taking that trayful to Lady Mary?" "Yes," I said. "Fay and them have had enough." "Then I don't want to prejudice you," Millie said. "But I think I ought to warn you. She's a witch." "Really," I said as I got out of the lift. "Then," Millie turned sideways to go past me. I could see she was angry then, pink and panting. "Then nothing." She said, "Just watch yourself, and Conrad, forget all the mean things I said about Christopher. I was being unreasonable. Christopher never misuses magic the way that, that, she does." The lift shut then and carried Millie away downward. I went along the blue moss carpet and around the corner to the best guest suite, thinking about Christopher. He could be very irritating, but he was all right, really. And now I considered he had set off to rescue Millie like a knight errant rescuing a damsel in distress. That impressed me. I wondered why I hadn't thought of Christopher that way before. I wished he would come back. I knocked at the big gold-rimmed double door, but no one told me to come in. After a moment, I knocked again, balanced the tray carefully on one hand, and went in. Lady Mary was sitting sprawled in a chair that must have come from another room. Everything in the huge frilly room was pink, but the chair was navy blue with the wrong pattern on it. Fay or Polly or someone must have lugged it in here from somewhere else. Lady Mary was clutching its arms with fingers bent up like claws and scowling at the fireplace. Like that, she looked almost as old as the countess, and not very beautiful at all. There was a half-open door beyond her. I could hear someone sobbing on the other side of it. Her lady's maid, probably. Oh, shut up, Stevens, and get on with that ironing! Lady Mary snarled as I came in. Then she saw me. Her big blue eyes went narrow, unpleasantly. I didn't say you could come in. She said, "I said very smoothly, like Mr. Prendergast imitating Mr. Amos, the fresh carafe and glasses you rang for, my lady." She unclawed a hand and waved it. "Put them down over there." She waited for me to cross the room and put the tray on a small table, and then snapped, "Now stand there and answer my questions." I was glad Millie had warned me. The hand waving must have been a spell. I found myself standing to attention beside the table, and the door to the corridor seemed a mile off. Lady Mary waved her hand again. 
This time I felt as if there was a tight band around my head, so tight that it somehow gave me pins and needles down both arms. I couldn't loosen it, however hard I tried. Why are you doing that? I said. Because I want to know what I'm taking on here, she said, and you're going to tell me. What do you think of Count Robert? He seems nice enough, but I really hardly know him, I said. By this time I was panting and sweating. The pressure around my head seemed to be worse every second. Please take this off, I said. No. Is Count Robert a magic user? Lady Mary said. I've no idea. I don't think so, I said. Please. But someone here is, she said. Someone's using magic to change things all the time. Why? To make money, I found myself saying. Who? Lady Mary asked. I thought of Christopher pressing that shift button. I thought of Mr. Amos. I thought my head was going to burst. And at the same time, I knew I wasn't going to tell this horrible woman anything else. I don't. I don't know anything about magic, I said. Nonsense, Lady Mary said. You're stuffed with talent. For the last time, who? Nobody taught me magic, I gabbled desperately. My head was going to crack like an egg any moment, I thought. I can't tell you because I don't know. Lady Mary screwed her mouth up angrily and muttered, Why don't any of them know? It's ridiculous. She looked at me again and said, What do you think of the Countess? Oh, she's awful, I said. It was a relief to be able to tell her something. Lady Mary smiled. It was more of a gloating grin, really. They all say that, she remarked, so it must be true. I'll have to get rid of her first thing then. Now, tell me. A change came just as she said this. I never thought I'd be glad of a change. The tightness around my head snapped, bing, like a rubber band that had been stretched too much. I staggered for a moment, pins and needles all over, eyes all blurry. But I could just see that the carafe and glasses on the tray had turned into a teapot, an elegant cup and saucer, and a plate of sugary biscuits. I took a look at Lady Mary. She was behaving as if the rubber band had snapped itself in her face, blinking her big eyes and gasping. Enjoy your tea, my lady, I said. Then I turned and ran. I went down in the lift, feeling awful. The pins and needles went away slowly, but they left me feeling very miserable indeed. Lady Mary was obviously going to take over Storery the moment she was married to Count Robert, or maybe even sooner. She would give me the sack at once because I knew what she was like. I had no idea what I would do then. It was no good asking Anthea. She was as badly off as I was, and Christopher was not here to ask. That was the good thing about Christopher. He never seemed to think anything was hopeless. If something went wrong, he made one of his annoying jokes and thought of something to do about it. I really needed that at the moment. I stopped the lift and sent it upward instead, just in case the changes had brought Christopher back. But our room was empty. I looked at Christopher's tie dangling from the doorknob and felt so lost that I began to wonder if Uncle Alfred was right after all about my evil fate. Everything went wrong for me all the time. Middle Hall was crowded that evening. Mr. Smithers and quite a few upper maids were sent to eat with the actors because Upper Hall was filled with valets and ladies' maids who had come with the guests. They had to help the guests get dressed, of course, so they had supper later. Mrs. Baldock was holding a special cocktail party for them in her housekeeper's room before that. Polly, Faye, Millie, and another girl had to bolt their food in order to race off and wait on Mrs. Baldock and her guests. The rest of us hardly had time to finish before bells began pealing and Miss Semple came rushing in. Quick, quick, all of you! That's Mr. Amos ringing. The company will be down in five minutes. 
Mr. Prendergast, you're in the Grand Saloon in charge of drinks. Oh, am I? Mr. Prendergast said, unfolding to his feet. Menial tasks, nuts and pink gin, is it? With Francis, Gregor and Conrad, Miss Semple rushed on. All other men servants to the banqueting hall to make ready there. Maids to the ballroom floor crockery store and service hatches. Hurry! The undercroft thundered with our feet as we all raced away. The part in the grand saloon is a bit of a blur to me. I was too anxious and upset to notice much, except that Mr. Prendergast plonked a heavy silver tray in my hands, which made my arms ache. The guests were mostly a roar of loud voices to me, fine silk dresses and expensive evening suits. I remember the Countess graciously greeting them all in floating blue with a twinkly thing in her hair, and I remember Count Robert coming and snatching up a glass from my tray, looking as if he really needed that drink, and then I noticed that the glass he had taken was orange juice. I wondered whether to call out to him that he had made a mistake, but he was off by then, saying hello to people, chatting to them, and working his way over to the door as if he expected Lady Mary to come in any minute. Lady Mary didn't arrive until right near the end. She was in white, straight white, like a pillar of snow. She went to Count Robert almost at once, and talked to him with her head bent and a shy smile. I could hardly believe she had spent the afternoon complaining and casting spells and making her maid cry. That, Mr. Prendergast said, looming up beside me, is a classic example of a glamour spell. I thought you might like to know. Oh, I said. I wanted to ask Mr. Prendergast how he knew, but he said, Your tray's slanting, and surged away to fetch Gregor a fresh soda siphon. Lady Felice arrived, wearing white, too, and looking horribly nervous. She went nearly as white as her dress when Mr. Amos flung the door open and boomed, The Mayor of Stalgester, Mr. Igor Suli. Mr. Suli looked really out of place. He was just as well dressed as everyone else, but he seemed smaller, somehow, a little sunken inside his good clothes. He walked in, trying to swagger, but he looked as if he was crawling, really. When the Countess rustled graciously up to him, he took hold of her hand with a grab, as if she was rescuing him from drowning. Then he caught sight of me and my tray, and came and took the largest glass, as if that was a rescue, too. "'Have you found out how they pull the possibilities yet?' he asked me in a whisper. "'Not quite,' I said. "'I, uh, we—' "'Thought not,' Mr. Suley said. He seemed relieved. "'Not to worry now,' he said. "'When I'm spliced to Felice, I'll be part of the set-up, and I'll be able to handle it for you. Don't you do anything until then. Understand?' "'But Uncle Alfred said—' I began. "'I'll fix your uncle,' Mr. Suley answered. Then he turned around and marched away into the crowd. Shortly after that, Mr. Amos unfolded the double doors at the end of the room and said in his grandest manner, My lords, ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. Everyone streamed slowly away into the banqueting hall, and it got quite peaceful. While Francis, Gregor and I were clearing up spilled nuts and piling glasses on trays to give to Polly and the other maids at the door, Mr. Prendergast stretched himself out with a sigh along the most comfortable sofa. An hour of peace at least, he said, and lit a long black cigar. Pass that ashtray, Conrad. No, make that nearly three hours of peace. I'm told they're having ten courses. The double doors opened again. Prendergast, Mr. Amos said, you're on front hall duty. Get on down there. But surely, Mr. Prendergast said, sitting up protestingly, everyone's arrived who's going to arrive. You never can tell, Mr. Amos said. Events like this often attract poor relations. Stollery prides itself on being prepared. Mr. Prendergast sighed. It was more of a groan, really, and stood up. 
And what do I do in the unlikely event that penniless cousin Martha or drunken Uncle Jim turn up and start hammering at the front door? Deny them? You use your discretion, Mr. Ramos growled, if you have any. Put them in the library, of course, man, and then inform me. And you, Gregor, Francis, Conrad, in the banqueting hall as soon as you've finished here. Service is slower than I would like. We need you. So, for the next two and a half hours, I was hard at it, fetching dishes for other footmen to hand over elegant shoulders and carrying bottles for Mr. Amos to pour. Manfred had done quite well and only dropped one plate, but Mr. Amos would not let Manfred or me do any of the actual waiting at table. He said he was taking no chances. But we were allowed to go around with cheese boards near the end. By this time, the chinking of cutlery and the roar of voices had died down to a mellow rumble, mixed with the occasional sharp dink. Mr. Ramos sent Andrew back to the Grand Saloon to make coffee, and after I had carried around special wine for the speech and the toasts, he sent me to the saloon too. Mrs. Baldock and Miss Semple were there, arranging piles of chocolates enticingly on silver plates. Mrs. Baldock seemed a little unsteady. I thought I heard her hiccup once or twice, and I remembered Christopher saying the first night we were here that he thought Mrs. Baldock drank, although she had just given a party, I suppose. I reached out to sneak a chocolate, thinking of Christopher. There had been no changes for hours now. Mr. Amos must have switched off his equipment, so Christopher was stuck for yet another night. Here Miss Semple slapped my reaching hand and brought me back to reality. She sent me hustling up and down the huge room, planting the piles of chocolates artistically on little tables. So I was able to snitch a chocolate anyway, before Andrew called me over to help him rattle out squads of tiny coffee cups and ranks of equally tiny glasses. I was thinking of Christopher, so I said what Christopher might have said. Are we having a doll's tea party? Liqueurs are served in small glasses, Andrew explained kindly and showed me a table full of round bottles, tall bottles, triangular bottles, flat bottles, red, blue, gold, and brown bottles, and one big green one. He thought I didn't know about liqueurs. If he had been Christopher, he would have known I was joking. The big round glasses are for brandy, Andrew instructed me. Don't go making a mistake. Before I could think of a Christopher-type joke about this, the Countess came sailing in through the distant doors, saying over her shoulder to a stout man with a beard, Ah, but this is story, Your Grace. We never have new brandy. Other guests came slowly crowding after her. Mrs. Baldock and Miss Semple vanished. Andrew and I went into furniture mode. The rest of the guests gradually filtered out across the room and settled into chairs and sofas. Mr. Suley had a lot of trouble over this. He kept trying to sit in a chair next to Lady Felice, but Lady Felice always stood up just before he got to her, and with a sad, absent-minded stare, walked away to another chair in another part of the room. Count Robert somehow got buried in the crowd. He was never anywhere near Lady Mary, who was sitting on a golden sofa beside her mother, looking lovelier than ever. Then Mr. Amos arrived. He closed the double doors on a violent crashing. Manfred was dropping plates again, I think, as the rest of the footmen cleared away the feast, and beckoned me and Andrew over to the table with the coffee cups. I was kept very busy taking around tiny, clattery cups. The main thing I remember about this part is when I had to take coffee to Lady Mary and her mother. As I got to their sofa, the mother put out her hand to take one of the chocolates on the table beside them. Lady Mary snapped at her in a little grating voice. Mother, those are bad for you. The mother took her hand back at once, looking so sad that I was sorry for her. I handed Lady Mary a cup of coffee and managed to make it rattle and clatter so much that Lady Mary put out both hands to it and turned to give me a dirty look. Behind her, I saw the mother's hand shoot out to the chocolates. I think she took about five. When I handed the mother her coffee, she gave me a look that said, Please don't give me away. 
I was just giving her a blank furniture look in reply that said, Give away what, my lady? When the door to the service area behind us opened, and Hugo and Anthea came quietly into the saloon. They were wearing evening dress, just like the guests. Hugo looked good in his, and far more natural than Mr. Suley. My sister was in red, and she looked stunning. Nobody seemed to notice them at first, except me. They walked slowly, side by side, out into the middle of the room, both looking very determined. Hugo was so determined that he looked almost like a bulldog. Then Anthea made a small, magical gesture, and the Countess looked up and saw them. She sprang up and swept toward them in a swirl of silky blue. "'What is the meaning of this?' she said in a fast, angry whisper. "'I will not have my guests disturbed in this way.' At this, Lady Mary looked up, looked at Anthea, and looked venomous. Beside my sister's black hair and glowing skin, Lady Mary hardly seemed to be there. She was like a faded picture, and she knew it. Across by the little cups and glasses, Mr. Amos looked up too. He stared, then he glared. If looks could have killed, Hugo would have dropped dead then, followed by Anthea. But Lady Felice was now standing up, slowly and nervously. She was so obvious in her white dress that most of the guests turned around to see what she was doing. They looked at her, and then they looked at Hugo and Anthea. The talk died away. Then Count Robert stood up and walked forward from the other end of the saloon. Everyone stared at him, too. One lady got out a pair of glasses on a stick in order to stare better. I apologize for the disturbance, Count Robert said, but we have a couple of announcements to make. The Countess whirled around to him and began to make her why, dear, face. She was sweetly bursting with rage. By the look of him, so was Mr. Amos, only not sweetly. But before either of them could speak, the main door at the far end of the saloon opened, and Mr. Prendergast stood and loomed there. The Honourable Mrs. Franconia Tesdinich, he announced, in his ringing actor's voice. Then he backed out of the room, and my mother came in. My mother looked even more unkempt than usual. Her hair was piled on her head in a big, untidy lump, rather like a bird's nest. She had found from some cupboard, where it must have hung for twenty years or more, a long yellow woolen dress. It had turned khaki with age. I could see the moth holes in it even from where I was. She had added to the dress a spangled bag she must have bought from a toy shop. And she sailed into that huge room as if she were dressed as finely as the Countess. I have never been so embarrassed in my life. I wanted to get into a hole and pull it in after me. I looked at Anthea, sure that she must be feeling at least as bad as I was. But my sister was gazing at our mother almost admiringly. With an affectionate grin growing on her face, she said to Hugo, My mother is a naughty woman. I know that dress. She saves it to embarrass people in. My mother sailed on like a queen through the room until she came face to face with the Countess. Good evening, Dorothea, she said. You seem to have grown very fine since you married for money. What became of your ambition to go on the stage? She turned to the lady with glasses on a stick and explained, We were at school together, you know, Dorothea and I. So we were, the Countess said icily. What became of your ambition to write, Fanny? I don't seem to have read any books by you. That's because your reading skills were always so low, my mother retorted. What are you doing here? the Countess demanded. How did you get in? The usual way, my mother said. By tram. The lodgekeeper remembered me perfectly well, and that nice new butler let me into the house. He said he had had instructions about poor relations. But why are you here? the Countess said. You swore at my wedding never to set foot in Stollery again. 
When you married that actor, you mean? said my mother. He must realize that only the most pressing reason would bring me here. I came. She was interrupted by Mr. Amos. His face was a strange color, and he seemed to be shaking as he arrived beside my mother. He put a hand on her moth eaten arm. Madam, he said, I believe you may be a little overwrought. Would you allow me to take you to our housekeeper? My mother gave him a short, contemptuous look. Be quiet, Amos, she said. This has nothing to do with you. I'm here purely to prevent my daughter from marrying this Dorothea's son. What? said the Countess. From the other end of the room, Lady Mary said, What? even louder, and sprang to her feet. There must be some mistake, my good woman, Lady Mary said. Robert is going to marry me. Count Robert gave a cough. No mistake, he said, or only slightly. Before the three of you settle my fate between you, I'd better say that I've already settled it myself. He went over to Anthea and pulled her hand over his arm. This is one of the announcements I was about to make, he said. Anthea and I were married two weeks ago in Ludwich. There were gasps and whispers all over the room. My mother and the Countess stared at each other in almost identical outrage. Count Robert smiled happily at them, and then at all the staring guests, as if his announcement was the most joyful thing in the world. And Hugo married my sister Felice this morning in Stalstead, he added. What? thundered Mr. Amos. But she can't, dear, the Countess said. I didn't give my consent. She's of age. She didn't need your consent, Count Robert said. Now look here, young lord, Mr. Sully said, getting up and advancing on Count Robert. I had an understanding. Mr. Amos cut him off by suddenly bellowing, I forbid this. I forbid everything. Everyone stared at him. His face was purple, his eyes popped, and he seemed to be gobbling with rage. I give the orders here, and I forbid it, he shouted. He's mad, some duchess said from beside me. He's only the butler. Mr. Amos heard her. No, I am not, he boomed. I am Count Amos Tezdinich of Stollery, and I will not have my son marry the daughter of an impostor. Everyone's faces turned to the countess then, my mother's very sardonically. The Countess turned and stretched her arms out reproachfully to Mr. Amos. Oh, Amos, she said tragically, how could you? Why did you have to give us all away like this? Too bad, isn't it? Hugo said with his arm around Lady Felice. Mr. Amos turned on him, so angry that his face was purple. You, he shouted. Goodness knows what might have happened then. Mr. Amos threw a blaze of magic at Hugo and Lady Felice. Hugo flung one hand up and seemed to send the magic back. Lady Mary joined in with a sizzle that shot straight at Anthea. My mother whirled around and sent buzzing lumps of sorcery at Lady Mary. Lady Mary screamed and hit back, which made my mother's bird's nest of hair tumble down into hanks on her shoulders. By then, Mr. Sully, Anthea, Count Robert, and some of the guests were throwing magic, too. The room buzzed with it all, like a disturbed wasp's nest, and there were screams and cries mixed in with it. Several chairs fell over, as most of the guests tried to retreat toward the banqueting hall. Mr. Prendergast threw open the door again. His voice thundered over the rest of the noise. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Pray silence for the Royal Commissioner Extraordinary. In. The magics and the shouting stopped. Everyone stared. Mr. Prendergast stood aside from the doorway and announced each person as he or she came in. 
there was quite a crowd of them. The first two were large, solemn men in dark suits, who went at once to stand on either side of Mr. Amos. Sir Simon Caldwell and Captain William Forsyth, Mr. Prendergast boomed, personal wizards to His Majesty the King. Mr. Amos looked from Sir Simon to Captain Forsyth in an astonished, hunted way, and then looked a little happier when two smartly dressed ladies came to stand on either side of Count Robert. The Princess Wilhelmina and Madame Anastasia Dupont. Sorceresses royal, Mr. Prendergast announced. Count Robert went very pale hearing this. Quite a lot of the guests went pale too, as the next group was announced. Mr. Prendergast intoned, Mrs. Havelock Harting, the prosecutor royal, Mr. Martin Baines, solicitor to His Majesty, Lord Constant of Goodwell and Lady Pierce Willoughby, King's High Justices. I forget the rest, but they were all legal people, and Mrs. Havelock Harting in particular was an absolute horror, grey, severe, and pitiless. They all stared keenly at everyone in the saloon as they spread out to make room for the next group of people. The Chief Commissioner of Police, Sir Michael Weatherby, Inspectors Hanbury, Cardross, and Goring. Mr. Prendergast boomed. This lot was in police uniform. It dawned on me around then that these were all the people the Countess had told the courier to send to a hotel in Stolchester. I felt a trifle dizzy at the Countess's nerve. I tried to imagine them all crowded into the Stolchester Arms or the Royal Stag, probably both, considering how many of them there were, and I simply could not see it. The Countess obviously knew what she had done. She had both hands to her face. When the woman Inspector Goring came and stood stonily beside her, the Countess looked as if she might faint. The other two inspectors went to stand by Hugo, who looked grim, and Mr. Sully, who went a sort of yellow. And the Chief Commissioner marched through the saloon and went to stand by the doors to the banqueting hall. Some of the guests who had been edging toward those doors went rather hastily to sit down again. The household wizards to the royal commissioner, Mr. Prendergast announced, and another group of sober-looking men and women filed in. They brought with them a cold, clean buzz of magic that reminded me somehow of the walker. And, Mr. Prendergast proclaimed, by special request of His Majesty the King, the Royal Commissioner Extraordinary, Monsignor Gabriel de Witt. Oh, no, I thought. Gabriel de Witt was every bit as terrifying as Christopher had led me to believe. He made Mrs. Havelock Harting look ordinary. He was very tall and dressed in foreign-looking narrow trousers and black frock coat, which made him seem about eight feet high. He had white hair and a grey triangular face, out of which stared the most piercing eyes I had ever seen. He brought such strong, age-old magic with him that he made my whole body buzz, and my stomach feel as if it were plunging down to the centre of the earth. I must warn Milly, I thought, but I didn't dare move. After all this, I was not surprised when Mr. Prendergast swept his large right hand toward his own chest and added, And also myself, the King's special investigator. Of course Mr. Prendergast was a detective, I thought. It made perfect sense. Gabriel de Witt stepped slowly forward. I must explain, he said. He had an old, dry voice, like a corpse speaking. I came to Series 7 initially in search of my two young wards, who seemed to have got themselves lost in this world. Naturally, I went to the King first and asked his permission to continue my search in this country. But the King had problems of his own. It seemed that somebody in this country kept changing the probabilities for this world. 
There had been so many shifts, in fact, that all Series 7 was in danger of flowing into Series 6 on one side and Series 8 on the other. The King's wizards were very concerned. Mr. Amos, looking very startled, shook his head and made denying gestures. It couldn't possibly have that effect, he said. Oh, yes, it could, Gabriel DeWitt said. I assure you that this is true. I noticed it from the moment I stepped into this world. There are beginning to be serious climate changes and even more serious disruptions to geography. Mountains subsiding, seas moving about, continents cracking apart, as this series tries to conform to the series on either side. Altogether, these changes constitute such a serious misuse of magic that when the king asked me for my help, I had no hesitation in agreeing. I and my staff started to investigate immediately. As a first result of our inquiries, a woman calling herself Lady Amos was arrested yesterday, and her offices in Ludwich closed down. No! Mr. Amos cried out. Yes, said Gabriel de Witt. I fancy she is your wife. And, he looked at Hugo, your mother, I believe. We now have enough evidence to make further arrests here in Stollery. Mrs. Havelock Harting, if you would be so good as to read out the charges. The grey, pitiless lady stepped forward. She rattled open an official paper and cleared her throat with a rather similar rattle. Robert Winstanley Henry Brown, Dorothea Clarissa Peony Brown, nay Partridge, Hugo Vandalin Cornelius Tesdinich, and Amos Rudolf Percival Vandalin Tesdinich, she read. You are all four hereby charged with treasonous imposture. The working of magic to the peril of the realm, fraud, conspiracy to defraud, and high treason. You are under arrest. Not high treason, Mr. Amos said. He had gone a queer, pale mauve. Count Robert, or plain Robert Brown, as I suppose he really was, had turned the same sort of colour Christopher went when he touched silver. I deny treason he said chokingly. I told Amos I wasn't going along with his pretense any more. I told him as soon as I got back from marrying Anthea. My sister, who was clearly trying not to cry, opened her mouth to speak, but Mrs. Havelock Harting simply turned implacably to one of the legal people. Make a note, she said. Tez Dinich the Elder and the male Brown enter pleas of not guilty as charged. And I am innocent the Countess said sobbingly. If she was not crying, she was doing a good job of pretending to. I never did any of this. No more did I, Mr. Amos said. This is all some kind of trumped up. He stopped and backed away as the red rubber ball came sailing through the saloon. When it reached Mr. Amos, it began bouncing up and down vehemently in front of him. Mistake. Mr. Amos finished, eyeing the ball queasily. One moment. Gabriel de Witt held up his hand and strode toward the bouncing ball. What is this? It's a ghost, Monsignor, said one of the royal wizards beside Mr. Amos. The other wizard added, hushed and shocked, It says it's been murdered, sir. Gabriel de Witt caught the ball and held it in both hands. There was a dead silence in the saloon as he stood there inspecting it, his face growing grimmer every second. Yes, he said, indeed, a female ghost. It says the evidence for the murder will be found in the library. Sir Simon, would you be so good as to accompany this unfortunate ghost to the library and bring the evidence back here to me? He passed the wizard the ball, Sir Simon nodded and carried it away past Mr. Prendergast and out through the door. This has nothing to do with me, Mr. Amos declared. You must understand, all of you. He spread his arms pleadingly. 
The trouble was that everyone was so shocked and frightened by the presence of a murdered ghost that nobody really took Mr. Amos seriously. My thought was that Mr. Amos looked like a short, pear-shaped penguin as he went on passionately. You must understand, I only acted for the sake of Stollery. When my father, Count Humphrey, died, Stollery was bankrupt. The gardens were a wilderness, the roof was falling in, and I had to mortgage everything to pay what staff we had. And they were a second-rate slipshot lord anyway. It nearly broke my heart. I love Stollery. I wanted to have it as it should be, well run, restored, beautiful, full of properly respectful servants. I knew that would take millions. I knew it would take all my time and energy. I knew it would take magic, specially applied magic. Magic I invented myself, I'll have you know, and secretly installed in the cellars. And in order to make my money... I had to have control of those cellars. The only person who has control of the cellars is the butler. So naturally I had to become the butler. You must see, I had to be the butler. I paid a young actor to take my place. Rudolf Brown and I looked much alike in those days. Yes, and you turned your own brother, my husband, out my mother said suddenly and bitterly, so he wouldn't get in your way. Hubert never got over it. Mr. Amos stared at her as if he had forgotten she was there. Hubert was quite happy running a bookshop, he said. No, he wasn't, my mother retorted. The bookshop was my idea. You are ignoring two things, Count Amos, Gabriel de Witt put in. First, that your elevation of your actor friend meant you were deceiving the king, which is treason. And second, that your attempt to restore Stollery was bound to come to nothing. Nothing, said Mr. Amos. He held up a hand and flourished it around the grand saloon, the guests, the chandeliers, the beautifully painted ceiling, the golden chairs and sofas. You call this nothing? Nothing. Gabriel de Witt repeated. You must have seen that all the other buildings constructed over this probability fault are, without exception, empty ruins. This probability fault is like a sink. It would have pulled Stollery into the same ruined state in the end, however much magic you used, however much money you poured into it. I imagine this place costs more to run every year. Ah! Here is Sir Simon again. He turned away from Mr. Amos's look of horrified disbelief as Sir Simon came striding among the lawyers and wizards. Of course, on this floor he could go in through the balcony to the library and be there and back in minutes. Sir Simon came up to Gabriel de Witt, holding the rubber ball in one hand. With the other hand, he was dangling my camera. Here we are, Monsignor he said. The victim claims that the murderer killed her by trapping her soul in this camera. For a moment I could not breathe. I swear my heart stopped beating. Then all of a sudden my heart thundered into life again, hammering in my ears until everything went grey and blotchy, and I thought I was going to pass out. I remembered then I had parked that camera on a bookshelf when Christopher got cramp. I remembered the flashlight going off in the face of that witch as she started to put a spell on me. And I remembered that peculiar magazine, illustrated with bad drawings. Not photographs, drawings. The witch came from a world where nobody dared take a photo because that trapped the person's soul inside the camera. I was a murderer. And I thought, I really do have an evil fate after all. I only dimly heard Gabriel de Witt saying, I must ask every person here to wait, either in this room or in the banqueting hall with the servants. I or my staff or the police must question each of you under a truth spell. Quite a number of the guests protested. I thought I must get out of here. I looked around and realized I was quite near the service door. I had been pushed back toward it when all the people had come in with Gabriel de Witt. While Gabriel de Witt was saying, 
Yes, it may indeed take all night, but this is a case of murder, madam. I began backing very slowly and gently toward that door. I backed while more guests protested. As I reached the door, Gabriel DeWitt was saying, I apologize, but justice must be done, sir. I went on backing until the door had swung open just a small bit behind me. Then, quite thankful that Mr. Amos had made me practice going in and out of room so much, I took hold of the door and slid myself around it. I let it close itself on top of my fingers so that it would not thump, and then stood for a moment, hoping that no one had noticed me. Gabriel DeWitt's in there, isn't he? Somebody whispered. I shot sideways and saw Millie pressed against the wall beside the door. She looked almost as terrified as I was. And the house is full of policemen, she said. Help me get away, Conrad. I nodded and tiptoed toward the service stairs. I told myself Millie would be much more frightened if I said why I needed to get away even more urgently than she did. I just whispered to her as she followed me. Where are they mostly, these policemen? Collecting all the maids and the kitchen staff and taking them to the banqueting hall to be questioned, she whispered back. I kept having to hide. Good, I said. Then we can probably get out through the undercroft. Can you make us both invisible? Yes, but a lot of them are wizards, Millie whispered. They'd see us. Do it all the same, I said. All right, she said. We tiptoed on. I couldn't tell if we were invisible or not. I think we must have been, though, because we passed the lift before we got to the stairs, and a policeman came out of it, pushing Mrs. Baldock and Miss Semple in front of him, and none of them saw us. Both housekeepers were crying. Mrs. Baldock in big, heaving sobs, and Miss Semple noisy and streaming. You don't understand, Miss Semple wept. We've both worked here most of our lives. If they turn us off over this, where do we go? What do we do? Nothing to do with me, the policeman said. Millie and I dodged around them and fled down the stairs to the ground floor. I pushed the green cloth door open a fraction there. There was a lot of noise in the entrance hall, where more policemen seemed to be marshalling gardeners, stablemen and chauffeurs up the main stairs. Most of them were protesting that only family were allowed to go up this way. I let the door shut itself, and we scudded away down to the undercroft. I had never seen the undercroft so deserted. It was dim, empty, and echoing. I could almost believe that the probability fault had already swallowed all the life down here. I led Millie as fast as I could toward the door between the kitchens and the cellars, where the gardeners usually brought their vegetables and fruit. This bit was not empty. Light was shining up the cellar steps from the open door at the bottom. There were sounds of people busy in the cellars. Millie and I both jumped violently when a strong, wizardly voice shouted upward, Go and tell him that shift key is completely stuck at on. If I turn the power on, we'll have changes all over the place again. Go on, hurry. I nearly laughed. Christopher stuck that key down, I thought. But somebody began coming up the steps at a run. Millie seized my wrist, and we sprinted past the top of the stairs and into the produce lobby before the person could get to the top of the cellar steps and see us. I opened the door, and we tiptoed out, really out, outside into the gardens. I was very dismayed to find that it was pitch dark out there, but I said, Now, run! Actually, we went at more of a lumbering trot, with our arms out in case we hit something, trying to follow the pale lines that were probably paths. I think that misled us a bit. We may have been following things that were accidentally pale. At any rate, after lumbering for what seemed half an hour, we found ourselves bursting out beyond some midnight black bushes into the wide open spaces of the park, not the garden as I had expected. It seemed much, much lighter up there. Oh, good, we can see, Millie said. And be seen, I thought. But we had to get outside the ground somehow. I began to run quite hard toward where I thought the main gate was, taking a straight line over the driveway and across the mown turf of the parkland. 
I felt I couldn't get away from Stollery fast enough. There was a deep woof somewhere near us, followed by the pounding of mighty paws. I had forgotten Champ. I said a bad word and slowed down. So did Millie. Is that a guard dog? she asked. She sounded even more nervous than I felt. Yes, but don't worry, I said, trying to sound thoroughly confident. He knows me. And I called out, Champ! Hey, Champ! We could trace Champ by the paws and the enormous panting at first. Then his huge, dark shape appeared out of the gloom at a gallop. Millie and I both panicked and clutched at each other. But Champ simply swerved toward us, showing us he knew we were there, and went hurtling on, uttering another deep woof. A second later, there was the most terrible noise in the distance. Champ burst out barking, a deep, chesty baying like thunder. Another dog joined in, this one high and ear piercing, and yapped and yapped and yapped, making even more noise than Champ. A horse started whinnying over and over madly. Mixed in with the animal sounds were human voices shouting, some high, some low, and angry. We had no idea what was going on until another human voice shouted ringingly, Shut up, the lot of you! There was instant silence. This was followed by the same voice saying, Yes, champ, I love you too. Just take your paws off my shoulders, please. Millie shouted, Christopher! and ran toward the voice. When I caught her up, she was hanging onto Christopher's hands with both hers, and I think she was crying. Christopher was saying, It's all right, Millie. I only had a little bother with the changes. Nothing else was wrong. It's all right. Behind them, looming against the dark sky, was a traveller's caravan, drawn by an irritated-looking white horse. Beyond its twitching ears and flicking tail, I could just see a man on the driving seat. His skin was so dark that I never saw him clearly. All I saw were his eyes, looking from me to Millie. The small white dog sitting beside him was much easier to see. Last of all, I picked out the faces of a woman and two children looking at us over the man's shoulders. Here, the small white dog decided I was an intruder and started yapping again. Champ, on the ground beside me, took this as a mortal insult and replied. The two yelled abuse at each other, fit to wake the dead. Do shut them up! I bawled across the din. The mansion's full of lawyers and police. And Gabriel's here, Millie yelled. She seemed to be having some kind of reaction to our narrow escapes. Anyway, she was shivering all over. Christopher said to the dogs, Shut up! And they did. I know he's here, he said to us. Gabriel and his merry men were all over the towers and empty castles yesterday, having a good look at the changes. I had an awful job keeping out of sight. We have to get away, Millie said. Christopher said, I know, and looked up at the traveller driving the caravan. Is there any chance you can take us all a bit farther? he asked. The man gave a sort of mutter and turned to talk with the woman. They spoke quickly together in a language I had never heard before. When the man turned back, he said, We can take you down to the town, but no farther. We have a rendezvous to make just after dawn. I suppose we can get a train there, Christopher said. Fine, thank you. The woman said, Climb in at the back then. So we all scrambled into the caravan, leaving Champ as a melancholy dark hump in the middle of the parkland. And the traveller clicked to his horse, and we drove away. It was strange inside the caravan. I never saw it properly, because it was so dark in there, but it seemed much bigger than I would have expected it to be. It was warm, at least it was warm to me, but Millie kept shivering, and full of warm smells of cloth and onions and spiciness, with a sort of tinny metallic smell behind that. Things I couldn't see kept up a tinkling and chiming from somewhere in the walls. 
there were what seemed like bunks to sit on, where Christopher and I sat with Millie between us to keep her warm, looking across to the two children, who had hurried inside to stare at us through the dimness as if we were the strangest things on earth. But they wouldn't speak to us, whatever we said. They've gone shy again. Take no notice, Christopher said. Why are you fleeing Stollery, Grant? I'm a murderer, I said, and I told him about the ghost and the camera. Christopher said, Oh, very soberly. After a while, he said, I could really almost believe you do have bad karma, Grant, although I know you don't. You certainly have vilely bad luck. Maybe it was the magic. Did you know you were absolutely covered in spells when I first met you? One of them may have been a death spell, but I thought I took them all off you while we were walking through the park. It was my turn to say, Oh. I explained rather angrily, One of those spells was supposed to make Mr. Amos give me a job. I know, Christopher said. That's why I took them off you. I wanted the job. What was Gabriel doing in Stollery, besides looking for me and Millie, that is? Arresting Mr. Amos, I said. Did you know he was my uncle? Gabriel can't be your uncle, said Christopher. He comes from series twelve. No, stupid, Mr. Amos, I said. My mother said she was married to Mr. Amos's brother. That usually does make a person your uncle, Christopher agreed. And Mr. Amos is really Count of Stollery. I told him. Not Count Robert. His father was an actor called Mr. Brown. The Countess is really plain Mrs. Brown. Christopher was delighted. Tell me all, Grant, he said. So I did. Millie said, with her teeth chattering, Did they arrest that witch too, Lady Mary? I don't think so, I said. But they may have been going to arrest Mr. Sully. What a pity, Millie said. Lady Mary ought to be arrested. She uses magic in the vilest way. But no, shut up, Christopher. Stop making clever remarks and tell me what happened to you now. How did you end up with the travellers? By using my brain, Christopher said, at last, before it rotted and fell out of my head. I confess that I got really stuck out in all those empty towers and mansions. Every time there was a change, and there were plenty of those, I seemed to get farther and farther off from Stollery. And half the time there didn't seem to be a way to get anywhere, even when I went outside. I got really tired and hungry and confused. I was in a giant building made entirely of glass, when the whole scene suddenly filled with Gabriel's people. Have you ever tried to hide in a glass house? Don't. It can't be done. And they were between me and the way to the roof, so I couldn't go up there to wait for another change. So I panicked. And then I thought, there must be another way. Then I thought of Champ. Champ was never allowed into the house. Just like Mr. Avonlock and Smedley, I said. The changes happen out in the park, too. They do, Grant, Christopher said. The probability fault has two ends. But one is out in the middle of nowhere, and nobody notices it. As soon as I realized that, I dodged out of the beastly greenhouse and went chasing out into the moors to look for the other end. But I don't think I'd ever have found it if the travellers hadn't come through more or less as I got there. They gave me some food, and I asked them to get me to Stollery. I hoped you were there by then, Millie, and they didn't want to do that at first. They said they would come out in the middle of the park. But I said I'd get them out through the gatehouse, so they agreed to take me. How do we get out through the gate? I asked. The words were hardly out of my mouth when the regular clop of the horse's shoes stopped. The traveller leaned back from the driver's seat and said, Here is the gatehouse. Right. Christopher got up and scrambled to the front of the caravan. I don't know what he did. The horse started walking again, and after a moment the inside of the caravan went so dark that the kids opposite me gave out little twitters of alarm. The next thing I knew, I was looking out of the back of the van at the tunnel of the gateway, with its gates wide open, and the horse was turning out into the road. 
I heard its hooves bang and slide on the tram lines as Christopher came crawling back. And then it must have found the space between the rails, because its feet settled into a regular clopping again. How did you do that? Millie asked. It was a professional enchantress sort of question, even though her teeth were still chattering. The gatekeeper wasn't there, Christopher said, so it was easy to short out the defences. They must have arrested him too. It was a long way down to Stalchester, and the horse went nothing like so fast as the tram. The slow clopping of its feet was so regular, and the inside of the caravan so cosy that I fell asleep, and dreamed slow cloves and metal scented dreams. From time to time I woke up, usually on the steep bits, where the horse went slower than ever, and the traveller put on the brake with a long slurring noise. And called out to the horse in his foreign language. Then I went to sleep again. I woke up finally when white morning light was coming through both ends of the caravan. The clopping hooves seemed louder, with a lot of echo to them. I sat up and saw Stalchester Cathedral going past very slowly at the back of the caravan. A moment later, the traveller leaned backward to say, "This is where we must put you down." Christopher jumped awake in a flurry to say, "Oh, right, thanks." I don't think Millie woke up until we were down in the street, watching the caravan swiftly rumbling away from us, jingling and tinkling all over, with the horse now at a smart trot. Millie started to shiver again. I was not surprised. Her striped stallery uniform was not at all warm, neither was mine, for that matter. We looked very out of place in the middle of the wet, slightly foggy street. Christopher's clothes must have been caught in one of the changes. He was wearing wide, baggy garments that could have been made of sackcloth, and he looked even odder than Millie and I did. "Are you all right?" he said to Millie. "Just freezing," she said. She lived most of her life in a hot country. Christopher explained to me. He looked anxiously around at the touristy boutiques on either side of the street. It's too early for these shops to be open. I suppose I could conjure you a coat. Coat, I thought. Sweaters, woolen shirts. I know where to find all these things. Our bookshop is just down the end of this street. I said. I bet my winter clothes are still there in my room. Let's sneak in and get some sweaters. Good idea, Christopher said. Looking worriedly at Millie, and then show us the way to the train station. I led them down the street and into the alley at the back of our shop. Our yard gate opened in the usual way, with me climbing to the top of it, leaning over to slide the bolt back, and then jumping down and lifting the latch. Inside the yard, the key to the back door was hanging behind the drainpipe, just as usual. I might never have been away, I thought, as we tiptoed through the office. In the shop, it was not quite as usual. The cash desk and most of the big bookcases were in different places. I couldn't tell whether this was from one of Uncle Alfred's reorganizations or because of all the changes up at Stallery. The place smelled the same anyway, of book and floor polish, and just a whiff of chemicals from Uncle Alfred's workroom. You two stay here, I whispered to Christopher and Millie. I'll creep up and fetch the clothes. Will anyone hear? Millie asked. She settled into the chair behind the cash desk with a weary shiver. As far as I knew, my mother was still up at Stallery. She had missed the last tram by the time she came into the Grand Saloon, and the first tram in the morning didn't get down to Stalchester until eight thirty. Uncle Alfred needed two large alarm clocks with double bells the size of teacups in order to wake up in the mornings. No, I said. And ran up the stairs as lightly as I could. It was strange. Our stairs seemed small and shabby after Stallery. The fizz of old magics coming from Uncle Alfred's workroom felt small and shabby too, after the magic I had felt from Christopher and from Stallery itself. And I had forgotten that the private part of our house smelled so dusty. I hurried through the strangeness up to the very top. To my room. 
and I could scarcely believe it when I got there. My mother had taken my room to write in. It was full of her usual piles of papers and copies of her books, and there by the window was her splintery old table with her typewriter on it. For a moment I thought it just might be one of the changes from Stollery, but when I looked closely I saw the marks where my bed and my chest of drawers had been. Still scarcely able to believe it, I shot down half a floor to Mum's old writing room. My bed was in there, upside down, and rammed in beside it was my chest of drawers, with all its drawers open, empty. All my clothes were gone, and my model aircraft, and my books. They had truly not expected me to come back. I felt, well, hurt is the only word for it. Very dreadfully hurt. But just in case, I went on down and looked into Anthea's room. That was worse. When I left, there had still been Anthea's furniture in there, along with Mum's papers. Now that was all cleared away. Uncle Alfred had made it into a store for his magical supplies. There were new shelves full of bottles and packets on three of the walls, and a stack of glassware in the middle. I stood and stared at it for a moment, thinking about Anthea. How did she feel at this moment, now they had arrested her new husband for fraud? I felt quite as bad. I pulled myself together and tiptoed across the landing to my mother's room. This was better. This room looked and smelled the same as always, though perhaps dustier, and her unmade bed was piled with heaps of her dusty, moth-eaten clothes. There were more clothes puddled in heaps on the floor. Mum had obviously thrown everything out of her cupboards when she hunted out that awful yellow dress to wear at Stollery. I picked up one of her usual mustard-coloured sweaters and put it on. It smelled of Mum, which somehow made me feel more hurt than ever. The sweater looked awful over my green and cream uniform, but at least it was warm. I picked up another thicker sweater for Millie and a jacket for Christopher, and hurried away downstairs. As I went, I thought I heard the shop door open with its usual muffled tinkle. Oh, no, I thought. Christopher is doing something cleverly stupid again. I put on speed and fairly charged out into the shop. It was empty. I stood in the polished space beside the cash desk and stared around miserably. Christopher and Millie must have left without me. I was just about to charge on out into the street, waving the clothes, when I heard the flop-flop of slippers hurrying down the stairs behind me. Uncle Alfred bustled out into the shop, tying his dressing gown over his striped pyjamas. Someone in the shop! He was saying as he came, I can't turn my back for a moment, never a wink of sleep. Then he saw me and stopped dead. What are you doing here? he said. He pushed his spectacles up his nose to make sure it was me. When he was certain, he ran his hands through his tousled hair and seemed quite bewildered. You're supposed to be up at Stollery, Con, he said. Did your mother send you back here? Does that mean you've killed your Uncle Amos already? No, I said, I haven't. I wanted to tell him that Mr. Amos had been arrested, so there. But I also wanted to tell Uncle Alfred just what I thought of him for putting spells on me and pretending I had an evil fate, and I couldn't decide which I wanted to say first. I hesitated, and after that I had lost my chance. Uncle Alfred more or less screamed at me. You haven't killed him, he shrieked. But I sent you up there with death spells all over you, boy. I sent you to summon a walker. I sent you with spells to make you know it was Amos Testinich you had to kill. And you let me down. He advanced on me in dreadful flopping of slippers, and his hands sort of clutching like claws. You'll pay for this, he shouted. His face was wild, with strange blotches all over it, and his eyes glared at me through his glasses like big yellow marbles. I might have had Stollery in my hands, these hands, but for you, 
he screamed. With you hanged and Amos dead, they'd give the place to your mother, and I can manage her. No, you're wrong, I said, backing away. There's Hugo, you see, and Anthea. He didn't listen to me. He almost never did, of course, unless I forced him to by going on strike about something. I could have been pulling the possibilities this moment, he howled. Just let me get my hands on you. I could feel the fizz of his magic rising around me. I wanted to turn and run, but I didn't seem to be able to. I didn't know what to do. Summon the walker again. Christopher's voice whispered urgently in my ear. I could feel Christopher's breath tickling the side of my face and the invisible warmth of him beside me. I don't think I have ever been so glad to feel anything. Summon it now, Grant. The corkscrew key hung around my neck, was tugged by invisible fingers, and flipped out over Mum's mustard-coloured sweater. I dropped the jacket and the sweater for Millie and grabbed the corkscrew key gratefully. I held it up. The string it was hanging on lengthened helpfully, so that I could more or less wave the thing in Uncle Alfred's glaring face. I hereby summon a walker, I screamed. Come to me and give me what I need. The cold and the feeling of vast, open distances began at once. I could see the immense, curving horizon beyond Uncle Alfred's untidy hair, glowing from the light that was out of sight below it. Uncle Alfred whipped around and saw it, too. His mouth opened. He started to back away toward the cash desk, but he did not seem to be able to. I could see dents on the sleeves of his dressing gown, where two pairs of hands were hanging on to each of his arms. As the figure of the walker crossed the huge horizon with its hurried, pattering steps, I could feel Christopher on one side of Uncle Alfred and Millie on the other, both holding on to Uncle Alfred like grappling irons. Uncle Alfred shouted, No! No! Let go! and plunged and pulled to get free. His arms heaved as if there were lead weights on him as Christopher and Millie hung on. The walker approached with surprising speed, its hair and clothing blown sideways without moving in the unfelt frozen wind it brought with it. In no time at all it was towering into the shop and looming among the bookcases, filling the space with its icy smell. Then it was standing over us. Its intent white face and long, dark eyes turned from Uncle Alfred to me. No! No! Uncle Alfred cried out. The walker's long, dark eyes turned to Uncle Alfred again. It held out to him the small, crimson-stained wine cork labelled Illery Wines, 1893. Don't point that at me! Uncle Alfred shrieked, pulling away backward. Pointed at Con. It's got a really strong death spell on it. The walker's white face nodded at him once. Both its arms swept out. It picked Uncle Alfred up bodily and pattered on past me, carrying Uncle Alfred as easily as if he had been a baby. The last I saw of him were his striped pyjama legs kicking frantically as he was carried away beside my right shoulder. As the walker itself passed me, there was a jerk at my neck, and the corkscrew key flew out of my hands and vanished. The feeling of wind and the horizon of eternity vanished at the same instant. Millie and Christopher became visible then, staggering away sideways, both looking extremely shaken. Christopher said in an unusually small, sober voice, I don't think I like either of your uncles, Grant. That, said a deep, dry voice from behind me, must be the first sensible notion you have had for months, Christopher. Gabriel de Witt was standing there, grey and severe, and looking tall as the walker in his black frock coat. He was not alone. 
All the staff who had come with him into the grand saloon were there too, crowded up against bookcases and standing in the space where the walker had been. Mr. Prendergast was with them, and the king's solicitor and one of the sorceresses royal, Madame Dupont it was, and the dreadful Mrs. Havelock Harting as well. My mother and Anthea were standing beside Gabriel de Witt, both very weary and tear-stained. But I was interested to see, looking around, that every single person there seemed as shaken as I was by the passing of the walker. Even Gabriel de Witt was a little greyer than he had been in Stollery. At the sight of him, and of all the other people, Christopher looked as dumbfounded as I had ever seen him. His face went as white as the walker's. He gulped a bit and tried to straighten the tie he wasn't wearing. I can explain everything, he said. Me too, Milly whispered. She looked downright ill. I shall speak to the two of you later, Gabriel DeWitt said. It sounded very ominous. For now, he said, I want to talk to Conrad Tezdinich. This sounded even more ominous. I can explain everything too, I said. I was scared, stiff. I thought I'd rather talk to Uncle Alfred any day. I come of a criminal family, you see, I said. Both my uncles, and I'm sure I do have an evil fate, whatever Christopher says. For some reason, this made Anthea give a weepy little laugh. My mother sighed. I need to ask you some questions, Gabriel DeWitt said, just as if I had not said anything. He pulled a packet out of an inside pocket of his ink-black respectable frock coat and passed it to me. It seemed to be a packet of postcards. Please look through these pictures and explain to me what you see there. Though I could not for the life of me see why Gabriel DeWitt should be interested in picture postcards, I opened the packet and pulled them out. Oh, I said. They were prints of the photographs I had taken of the double spiral staircase where we saw Millie. There was one of just the staircase, then two of Millie on the same staircase, shouting across at Christopher, and then one of the same staircase, looking up toward the dirty glass of the tower. But something had gone wrong with all of them. Behind each one, misty but quite distinct, were the insides of other buildings, dozens of them. I could see fuzzy hallways, other stairways, domed rooms in many different styles, ruined stone arches, and several times what looked like a giant greenhouse. They were all on top of one another in layers. I think I must have loaded a film that someone else had used first, I said. Gabriel DeWitt simply said, Continue looking, please. I went on down the pile. Here was the hall the double stairway had led down to. But the other person seemed to have photographed a marble place with a sort of swimming pool in it, and somewhere dark with statues behind that. The next was the room with the harp, but this had literally dozens of rooms mistily behind it, blurred vistas of ballrooms and dining rooms and huge saloons, and a place with billiard tables on top of what looked like several libraries. The next two photographs showed the kitchens, with dim further kitchens behind them, including the knitting on the chair and the table with the strange magazine on it. The next... I gave a sharp yelp. I couldn't help it. The witch had been even nearer than I'd thought. Her face had come out flat and round and blank, the way faces do when you push a camera right up to them. Her mouth was open in a black and furious crescent, and her eyes glared flatly. She looked like an angry pancake. I didn't mean to kill her, I said. Oh, you didn't kill her, Gabriel DeWitt, to my astonishment, replied. You merely trapped her soul. We found her body in a coma in one of those kitchens while we were exploring the alternate buildings, and we returned it to 7D, where I am pleased to say they promptly put it in prison. 
She was wanted in that world for killing several enchanters in order to obtain their magical powers. Millie gave a small gasp at this. One of Gabriel DeWitt's tufty eyebrows twitched toward Millie, but he continued without interrupting himself. We have, of course, returned the woman's soul to 7D now, so that she may stand trial in the proper way. Tell me what else you see in those pictures. I leaped through the pile again. These two of Millie on the stairs would be quite good, I said, if it wasn't for all the buildings that have come out behind her. They were not there when you took the photographs? Gabriel DeWitt asked me. Of course not, I said. I've never seen them before. Ah, but we have, said one of Gabriel DeWitt's people, a youngish man with a lot of light curly hair and a brown skin. He came forward and handed me a packet of differently shaped photographs. I took these while we were searching the probabilities for Millie and Christopher, he said. What do you think? These were photographs of two ruined castles, some marble stairs leading up from a pool, a ballroom, a huge greenhouse, and the double spiral staircase again. And the last one was of the rickety wooden tower where Christopher and I found Champ. All of them, to my shame, were clear and single and precise. They're much better than mine, I said. Yes, but just look, said the man. He took my first photograph of Millie on the stairway and held it beside four of his. Look in the background of yours, he said. You've got both these ruined castles in it and the glass house, and I think that blurred thing behind them is the wooden tower. And if you take yours with the harp, you can see my ballroom at the back of it quite clearly. See? The sorceress royal said, In our opinion, and Mrs. Havelock Harting agrees with me, it's a remarkable talent, Conrad, to be able to photograph alternate probabilities that you can't even see. Isn't this so, Monsignor? She asked Gabriel DeWitt. Mr. Prendergast added, Hear, hear. Gabriel DeWitt took my photographs back from me and stood frowning down at them. Yes, indeed, he said at last. Master Tezdinich here has an extraordinary degree of untrained magical talent. I would like, he turned his frown on my mother, to take the lad back with me to series twelve and make sure that he is properly taught. Oh, no! Anthea said. I believe I must, Gabriel DeWitt said. He was still frowning at my mother. I cannot think what you were doing, madam, neglecting to provide your son with proper tuition. My mother's hair was down all over the place, like an unstuffed mattress. I could see she had no answer to Gabriel DeWitt, so she said tragically, now all my family is to be taken from me. Gabriel DeWitt straightened himself, looking grim and dour even for him. That, madam, he said, is what tends to happen when one neglects people. And before my mother could think what to say to this, he added, The same thing can be said to myself, if this is any consolation. He turned his grim face to Millie. You were quite right about that Swiss school, my dear, he said to her. I went and inspected it before I came on here. I should have done that before I sent you to it. It's a terrible place. We shall see about a better school as soon as we get home. Millie's face became one jubilant, shivering smile. Christopher said, What did I tell you? It was clear that Christopher was still in bad trouble. Gabriel DeWitt said to him, I said I would speak to you later, Christopher, and then turned to Mrs. Havelock Harting. May I leave all outstanding matters in your capable hands, prosecutor? It is more than time that I returned to my own world. 
please present my compliments to His Majesty and my thanks to him for allowing me the freedom to investigate here. I shall do that, the formidable lady said. We would have been quite at a stand without you, Monsignor. But, she added rather more doubtfully, did your magics last night definitely stop those dreadful probability changes? Very definitely, Gabriel DeWitt said. Some foolish person appeared to have jammed the shift key to on. That was all. I saw Christopher wince at this. Luckily, Gabriel DeWitt did not notice. He went on. If you have any further trouble, please send a competent wizard to fetch me back. Now, is everyone ready? We must leave. Anthea rushed at me and flung her arms around me. Come back, Conrad, please. Of course he will, Gabriel DeWitt said rather impatiently. No one can leave his own world forever. Conrad will return to act as my permanent representative in Series 7. I have just come back to Series 7 to be agent for the Crestomancy here. Before this, I spent six blissfully happy years at Crestomancy Castle, learning magic I never dreamed existed and making friends with all the other young enchanters being educated there. Elizabeth, Jason, Bernard, Henrietta, and the rest. Although the first week or so was a little difficult. Christopher was in such bad trouble and so annoyed about it that the castle seemed to be inside a thunderstorm until Gabriel DeWitt forgave him. And Millie turned out to have caught flu. This was why she had been feeling so cold. She was so ill with it that she did not go to her new school until after Christmas. At the end of the six years, when I was eighteen, Gabriel DeWitt called me into his study and explained that I must go home to Series 7 now, or I would start to fade, not being in my own world. He suggested that the way to get used to my own world again was to attend Ludwich University. He also said he was sorry to lose me, because I seemed to be the only person who could make Christopher see sense. I am not sure anyone can do that. But Christopher seems to think so, too. He has asked me to come back next year, to be best man at his wedding. He and Millie are using the gold ring with Christopher's life in it as a wedding ring, which seems a good way to keep it safe. Anyway, I have enrolled as a student in Ludwich, and I am staying with Mr. Prendergast in his flat opposite the Variety Theatre. Though Mr. Prendergast isn't really an actor, he never can stay away from theatres. Anthea wanted me to stay with her. She keeps bringing me up from New Rome to say I must live with her and Robert as soon as she gets back. She is in New Rome supervising her latest fashion show. She has become quite a famous dress designer. And Robert is away too, filming in Africa. He took up acting as soon as the police let him go. Mrs. Havelock Harting decided that as Robert only discovered Mr. Amos's fraud when his father died and then refused to be part of it, he could not be said to be guilty. Hugo had a harder time, but they released him too in the end. Now, and I could hardly believe this when Mr. Prendergast told me, Hugo and Felice are running the bookshop in Stalchester. My mother is still writing books in their attic. We are driving up to see them next weekend. Mr. Ramos is still in jail. They transferred him to St. Helena Prison Island last year, and the Countess is living in style in Buda Parich, not wanting to show herself in this country. And, Mr. Prendergast is not sure, but he thinks this is so, Mr. Sewley went there to join her when he got out of prison. Anyway, Stalchester has a new mayor now. No one has seen or heard of my Uncle Alfred since the walker took him away. Now I have learned about such things, I am not surprised. The walkers are messengers of the Lords of Karma, and Uncle Alfred tried to use the Lords of Karma in his schemes. And Stollery is falling into ruin, 
Mr. Prendergast told me sadly, and becoming just like all the other deserted probability mansions. I remembered Mrs. Baldock and Miss Semple coming weeping out of the lift, and wondered what had become of all the staff who had lost their jobs there. Oh, the king stepped in there, Mr. Prendergast told me cheerfully. He's always on the lookout for well-trained domestics to man the royal residences. They've all got royal jobs, except Manfred, Mr. Prendergast added. He had to give up acting after he fell through the wall in a dungeon scene. I think he's a schoolteacher now. The king wants to see me tomorrow. I feel very nervous. But Fay Marley has promised to go with me, at least as far as the door, and hold my hand. She knows the king well, and she says she thinks he may want to make me a special investigator, like Mr. Prendergast. You notice things other people don't see, darling, she says. Don't worry so much. It'll be all right. You'll see. The End You've been listening to Conrad's Fate, a Crestomancy story by Diana Wynne-Jones, narrated by Gerard Doyle. This book is copyrighted 2005 by Diana Wynne-Jones. This recording is copyrighted 2005 by Recorded Books.